for viewers that have never heard this name, Charles R. R. Johnson is a uh, professor. Is he at Washington State University? Is that it? Uh, University of Washington. University yeah. of Washington. Uh, he's a uh, he's a professor. He's a philosopher. Uh, I think formally that's his training, right? He's a philosopher, and he's just sort of like fell into writing. It seems a little bit accidentally. Um, he grew up just thinking that he would be a a cartoonist, but uh, I believe it's in the introduction to the book that we're talking about, Oxford and Tale. I'm not sure if your edition is the same as mine. Um, he just Mine's a, a little bit different. But yeah, so maybe some of the some of the page numbers will be a little different. But so he in the introduction, he uh, talks about how he wasn't necessarily trying to be a writer, but just by sitting down and doing it. Right. He saw how pleasurable it was, how much it becomes this kind of like, you know, I'm not sure if you characterize it as a game, but I'm sure that most writers feel that way. Right. Like if you sit down and you and you try to you know craft some kind of world you are essentially at some point really starting to compete with yourself, right? There's always something that you, that you could do, right? It becomes very, very pleasant, especially if you're liable to get lost in, in, in these kinds of worlds. Um, and he actually did a very long interview with, with Dan. Uh, I believe that was the first Dan Schneider interview, maybe like 2007, uh, perhaps 2008. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put that into the uh, the sh show notes in the, in the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. But th that sort of gives, you know, his, his kind of, uh, I guess, general worldview, if you don't want to come into it through reading any of the books. Um, and I'm not sure if do you have any details you want to add about about his uh, his life or, or his work uh, outside of uh, Oxford and Tale? Sure. So I, you've already done a nice job with uh, with several pieces there, and and that's just it. He talks pretty extensively in that interview with Dan, uh, the written interview, about sort of stumbling into becoming a novelist. And he he was a cartoonist. He thought he'd probably spend a career as a cartoonist and illustrator, and and he has a lot of illustrations, uh, you know, out there. I mean, he completed, I think, he said over one thousand published illustrations. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and still does that work, I believe, from time to time. Um, and then, you know, he's also a, a, a not lifelong, but close to lifelong Buddhist. Um, he's He's been a Buddhist for the vast majority of his life. He's in his 70s now. I, I think he, he started down that path in his late teens or in his 20s and also um, was involved with martial arts for a really mm -hmm. long time. So these are, these are things that stuck with him and, and influenced him a lot. And I think of the writing of his that I've read, um, Ox Herding Tale features these, these Buddhist ideas the most, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they can, pieces of it can be found in faith in the good thing or middle passage, uh, and maybe some of his short stories too. But this book really brings that to the forefront as a, a driving force in, in terms of just the, the narrative of the text. Um, and so, I think that's it. You know, he faith in the good thing was his first published novel, and then he had Middle Passage, and then this one, and then uh, there was Dreamer, uh, which is you know ostensibly about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and then some short story collections and uh, a few essays as well. He, I think, Dan might even have a bit of a, a commentary piece or a, a critical piece on uh, Turning of the Wheel, which mm -hmm. is. About, about Buddhism and about writing. It's a set of essays that he wrote some years ago. So um, interesting, very interesting person and uh, just an a, a amazing writer. And he, you know, one of the key things um, with Johnson that we'll talk about often, I think, as we go through the book is that he's, he's African-American and that frames so much of his writing and what he's chosen to focus on, but he does it in a, a unique way and um, and just, I don't even know what to say. It's, uh, he's so inventive, I think with, with the, the takes that he has on mm -hmm. some of these uh, traditional African American, um, tales and, and, and styles of writing. So, uh, that'll come through certainly as we go through Oxherding tale here. Yeah, uh, when when I was thinking about how how to like characterize like how does a uh, race or perhaps even his own race, right? I'm always kind of like you know, it's always a little bit sketchy to to bring a biography into into a text, right? But mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do we characterize uh, the role of race in a book like this? Um, 
you, on the one hand, right, you, you can't deny that race plays a critical role here, right? I mean, you know, it, it is a, uh, a a slave narrative, or perhaps it is a, it is a take on slave narratives uh, from the past. Um, and you don't want to say that he therefore, like, you know, somehow turns away from race, but he does not, you know, he, he doesn't frame um, uh, the story in a kind of typical fashion. So like, um, in, uh, from, from some of my notes here, um, yeah. So, you know, in, 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 uh, kind of like slave narratives, I guess, more generally, you could sort of separate them into two categories early on. Uh, I guess perhaps, you know, maybe th this was because of, uh, the kinds of things that were allowed to be published versus not, uh, the earliest published slave narratives uh, dealt with, you know, themes of kind of like Christian re redemption, right? Even if there was a kind of like, you know, perhaps abolitionist uh, undercurrent, um, it was much more geared towards uh, how can we either, you know, uh, through slavery or after slavery, uh, whether there's this, an escape or no escape, how can you find redemption through uh, Christianity, right? Which, I mean, if you think about it, like it's, it's very kind of self-serving in a way, right? If this is the kind of stuff that's allowed to be published, right? There's a, a very specific reason why that is, right? It's kind of like taking on many of the uh, many of the assumptions, right? Of uh, of uh, whatever status quo that we could point to, right? Almost all of them being under a Christian context. Um, mm -hmm. Then you had a, another category of, of slave narratives that uh, had to do with like, you know, more, you know, uh, it, it was more political, right? On the one hand, you had people that, you know, generally were, you know, kind of uh, feeling more and more comfortable with the reality of slavery, just, you know, as it existed. And then, of course, you also had, um, you know, the, the conflict to, between North and South, where, you know, uh, abolitionism uh, could could be a, a, a political cause uh, for, for power beyond merely just kind of like, you know, a, a moral statement. So you had a lot of uh, abolitionist literature coming out and slave narratives uh, in this kind of second wave, um, like early 1800s, uh, mid 1800s, um, but they were more focused on, you know, how can we show the kind of brutality of slavery? And uh, with, with Ox Herding Tale, it, it kind of does both in this weird way, right? Where um, on the one hand, like, first of all, like it, it's a Buddhist slave narrative, right? It's not, it's not a Christian one, right? So, but there's still this kind of like sense of of redemption, right? Or, or this kind of striving towards some kind of spiritual statement, some sort of a, a, a you know, just kind of a spiritual state. Um, and it, it's not, again, it's not through the Christian uh, tradition, but but you still have that uh, sense of like a a, a personal ful fulfillment that goes beyond, you know, uh, just a political comment. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, uh, I'm not familiar with like the earliest like slave narrative. So I'm not sure, you know, how many of them maybe like played down the realities of, of slavery. But uh, although uh, uh, th this, this has this like spiritual, spiritual element, right? Johnson never does turn away from the brutality of slavery. But the way that, that, that he focuses on it is he does it through character, right? He does it through how, how, mm -hmm. character, how characters interact with one another. Even if you have like, you know, people that are, you know, maybe like enlightened liberals, right? Uh, the the best example being, you know, um, the owner of the protagonist, uh, Andrew, right? He's uh, uh, he's a slave owner, right? But he's not brutal, right? With his, with his slaves. In fact, uh, with uh, George, who is Andrew's uh, father, um, uh, uh, there's this kind of like relationship, right? Between... Um, you know the the slave master and the slave that uh, is you know it's 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 kind of um, I, I don't want to call it necessarily like a, a friendship but it's sort of presented a little bit as a friendship but you have all these like you know subtle occurrences that happen like even in the first chapter that show that you know irrespective of whatever friendliness that a, a slave owner might show his slave um, there's still this kind of you know, th 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 there's still this discrepancy between the two, right? Even, you know, uh, uh, when you see uh, George kind of like going through the house at night and feeling like nothing there at all belongs to him, he needs to uh -huh. be extra careful with this property, despite the fact that, you know, he's ostensibly being sent, right, to have sex with his owner's wife, right? And his owner uh -huh. is going to have sex with his, his wife. But when it comes to, you know, the actual like physical property, 
right? Uh, around the house, right? He has to be uh, uh, extra careful. Um, and uh, so uh, th- this is based on the the 10 uh, ox herding uh, pictures, right? From, from uh, I believe it's, it's Zen Buddhism. Let me uh, see if I could share this. Yeah. All right, you see that? Yeah, it's up. Good. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if, if you had any comments specifically on, on the 10 bulls or or uh, what. Um, uh, as a kind of like, you know, it's like, you know, you, we could see it as a controlling metaphor, right? I mean, the title of the, of the text, Ox Herding Tail, it's taken, you know, uh, almost a verbatim from, from uh, uh, this uh, part of the tradition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know that we need to spend a, a lot of time on it other than to say it's probably worthwhile for readers to to go ahead and look through these and read the little bits of poetry alongside the illustrations. But um, it is a, a controlling metaphor. It's um, it, it's sort of its own take on, again, you know, the typical pilgrim's progress sort of idea that that's popped up in Christianity and just um, a person searching for something and eventually wrestling with it and, and, and overtaking it and um, sort of absorbing it into their life. But then at the end of the ox herding pictures here, it's a return, you know, quote, back to society for the, the person who's tamed the bull or the ox to uh, spread their wisdom to others or attempt to do that. So um, yeah, the, it, it's, it's a, as we go through, examining the novel here it'll become obvious that uh, there's a lot of ways that johnson frames up andrew hawkins the the main character's experience through this lens and um yeah maybe doesn't completely fit it uh dovetail style i mean not every single thing needs to be filtered through it but quite a bit Mm -hmm. of it uh does so um yeah I, i'm not sure if it's from the intro uh to the text or if it's from uh uh turning turning the wheel right was the name of his essays um correct yeah uh, he, uh, he, uh, somewhere he discusses like th- this specific part of um the uh the 10 pictures right where you know you you have uh the um the searcher right essentially disappearing right and this is mm-hmm. supposed to be, I guess, um, disappearance of of the ego, right? In the sense that um, uh, you feel like fully part of the universe, right? You feel like um, you know nothing is apart from you, uh, and you are apart from nothing, right? But instead, you're you're just kind of you know filtering everything through everything else, mm-hmm. right? This is um, uh, supposed to be uh, the uh, you know kind kind of the idea. B- behind it right uh kind of like you know a parable for you know a buddhism itself right or, or some of the key things at least like in the west that we sort of uh, ha- have learned about um uh buddhism um and just just before i guess we, we read uh, the text itself uh i also want to mention and, and you you said the same thing in your notes right we kind of like focus on on the same thing you know by way of introduction and that is, it's it's a very dense book, right? We both highlighted highlighted the fact that it's only 176 pages, mm-hmm. um, but it feels longer simply because, like, first of all, you have to kind of like sit and 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 wait with the text a lot, right? The um, th- there's a lot that's actually going on, uh, not just plot wise, but the sentences are just very kind of you know they're very heavy in the sense that um, there's a there's a kind of like perfect perfectionistic quality to it. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, there's, there, there's a lot of like really a nice use of, of vocabulary here where, you know, it's, it, it's stuff that you don't, you know, words that you wouldn't necessarily see, you know, in, in a slave narrative, right. Um, or in mm-hmm. most novels for that matter, but the fact that it's, you know, only 176 pages, you get a ton of vocabulary pretty much, uh, on every page, right. You, words that are used in very kind of unconventional ways, um, uh, the poetry just kind of, you know, uh, hits you uh, uh, pretty frequently, right? Like, just like the descriptions are oftentimes very, very apt as we pull out some of the specific quotes, like uh, uh, re- uh, viewers will very much be able to to see that. Um, and uh, 
there's also this kind of like feeling where, you know, you have these like almost like Dickensian sort of characters, right? They all have like these like odd little features, right? But uh, mm -hmm. I, I think unlike Dickens, um, you know, all the characters here, I, I would say are probably a lot richer than, you know, uh, any uh, uh, Dickens character that I could probably uh, point to. Um, and again, it's kind of like, you know, in the nature of, okay, you only have 176 pages to do a great novel. Uh, you're, you decide to bring in all these like spiritual elements that are unconventional. Um, and you have, you know, a, a cast of characters that, you, you, you know, honestly, you don't get to see them that often. So what you are allowed to see, it's like, you know, a glimpse here, a glimpse there. And then maybe a couple of pages suddenly come at you where there's a much richer set of characterization. And that's kind of like you don't see them again for, you know, another uh, few dozen or in the case of like some characters like um, Minty, you know, you don't see her for like another hundred pages. Right. And then she becomes like a, a kind right. of controlling feature. So be, because of that reality, that that kind of constrain uh, with the length and, and you know, the, the style that he settled on, which is kind of like just very rich and dense. Um, uh, you, 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 you get tons of characterization while also, you know, constant getting a, a reprieve, right. And constant getting, you know, a, a, a kind of circulating set of characters, right. That you could sort of attach yourself to and sort of, you know, detach from, it's like this, you know, a, a, a lot of the, the stuff structurally, which we're going to get into, it does mirror, you know, some of the ideas, uh, behind Buddhism that, um, he's trying to get at, right. You know, structurally, formally, we, we get a, a lot of that sense, like the moves that he establishes. Um, we get, um, uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we get a ton of that. Um, was there anything else? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, 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 I guess uh, we could, we could get into the, oh, one more, one more thing about how, how slavery is treated. I guess we sort of uh, touched on that. So w when we were talking about like, you know, how, how can we like discuss uh, race here? Uh, you know, on the one hand, like, yes, uh, this is like a runaway slave narrative, right? So in terms of like pure social constraint, you know, the kind of like uh, overarching thing that has to occur in terms of the plot is Andrew is running away from ostensibly like, you know, some sort of punishment, right? He's running away from, although he wasn't part of like a savage form of slavery, right? He had like a, a white liberal sort of master. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, he is, uh, you know, he, he does have something to fear, right? He has that that soul catcher to fear, right? He he has uh, the fact that there are authorities after him uh, beyond uh, the soul catcher, right? He, there, there is like this kind of, you know, physical danger all around, but partly also because of the fact that, you know, he comes from a more, more kind of like educated background. He learned how to read. He, he had a, a tutor in philosophy and, and literature and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of the, the narrative is not simply, you know, an escape from uh, the physical, right? It is, you know, in parallel to uh, the ox herding pictures. Um, it's the sense of like, he's, he's running away from himself. He keeps kind of entering mm -hmm. and exiting, you know, the, the life of a uh, samsara, which is, uh, in, in, uh, uh, Hinduism, like the, the life that, you know, is, um, uh, maybe it's a little too severe to, to frame it like this, but the way that I would understand its function in this book is it's the life that people, uh, live. That's kind of like mundane, like sort of like every day. Uh, that gets them away from their actual real goal, right? And Andrew has this like thing where he keeps trying to sort of escape himself in a way, right? And he has to come back to himself, right? He has to become part of the wider universe, right? So on the one hand, you you know, you it's not like you get you get an escape from the savagery of of uh, 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 slavery, but slavery itself, that brutality becomes a kind of stand-in for these more kind of, you know, philosophical questions, right? Um, and also these more kind of psychological questions, right? You get the brutality, but you get uh, everything else too, that that necessarily almost has to be filtered through, you know, an educated point of view, which is which is Andrew's point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's all well summarized. And uh, one th quick final thing I did want to mention before we start just getting into the text proper is that Talking about the density of the book, uh, this is something else that Johnson mentions in the written interview with Cosmoetica, that, uh, and this is just something that 
we all could learn from as you know anyone who's a reader or an aspiring writer, especially novelist. He he cut two thousand four hundred pages. Oh yeah, we should have mentioned that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know he um he talks about that in more detail in that interview, but essentially that his writing style is to build, 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 and just have a ton of material to work through. And then go ahead and cut and cut and cut and that he really enjoys that process. That's, that's, you know, one of the things that um, he feels like is, you know, life giving about writing is, is kind of getting it down to the final form, Mm -hmm. but it just shows, you know, that um, there could have been so much bloat, right? He Mm -hmm. could have left this as some uh, attempt to make a a, a slave narrative epic or something Mm -hmm. simply by length. And, and or, or a multi generational kind of family affair, right? Which, sure. which is also yeah. like a thing that happened. Yeah, of course. So you know, he could have he could have stretched this out to be five hundred, one thousand, one thousand five hundred pages, uh, but he he made some really smart decisions here to mm-hmm. go ahead and and get rid of. And he talks about this in that interview. You know, a lot of good writing. Uh, mm-hmm. He says he it's actually kind of a, an interesting little anecdote. Uh, from that conversation with Dan, where he says that one of his f- favorite things uh, to do is read through this book that he has called like uh, Lost Quotations or something like that with a lot of, you know, great writers um, highlighting things they cut from well-known works that would have been in there and how good a lot of those things are. Mm-hmm. But it just didn't work and, or it wasn't necessary and didn't have to go in. Mm-hmm. And so just the importance of making those kind of decisions. Um, mm-hmm. And he... You know, he obviously did that very well uh, with all of his novels because he he says that's his process, period. But mm-hmm. um, but here with Oxherding Tale, it's it's one of the critical things uh, that he did to lend it so much density. But um, at the same time, one of the things that stood out to me the most here upon rereading it is uh, how how nice the balance is that he strikes between seriousness and levity mm-hmm. um humor and and um and and tragedy right i mean all mm-hmm. these things are so well interwoven uh that it it really moves the narrative along it, it really that's one of the things that stretches this book out and makes it feel mm-hmm. uh longer and more epic than it is um and and i think johnson mm-hmm. does a great job of letting the reader fill in a lot of these gaps and and so your own imagination can work on it mm-hmm. and exist in this world and, and build out from there. So um, anyway, we can, we can start jumping into the, you know, the plot proper and some of Andrew's characteristics and some passages. Um, yeah. So, so the, the, the book uh, begins with uh, Cripplegate. It's, it's a, a plantation uh, in, in South Carolina. And um, it, it just starts with this kind of like, uh, you know, we're talking about like various trope inversions, right? Uh, you mentioned earlier how, you know, there's like a ton of uh, humor in this book, which again, it's not something that you would ordinarily associate with a slave narrative, but you do yeah. get a ton of humor here. Just like you get a ton of humor, obviously, in Mark Twain, right? Uh, another yeah, kind yeah. of like, you know, well, por- I guess partly a slave narrative. Um and uh, I mean, the scene starts uh, with Andrew sort of like reminiscing about uh, this past, right? And interestingly enough, like he's not, um, he, he wasn't around like to observe any of this in detail, obviously, right? He wasn't born at, at this point uh, when when he sort of gets into his own origin story, but he he, he sort of gets into this. Uh, uh, and again, I forget if this is from Charles Johnson or Johnson was coding somebody, but you know, this idea of like memory, right? Uh, is, uh, is memory, uh, nothing more than imagination, right. Mm-hmm. Or, or the two kind of, you know, one in the same, uh, at least in some respects. Uh, so you, you get the sense that, you know, Andrew, as the text goes on, you know, he's definitely embellishing things. Uh, perhaps he is sort of structuring, you know, his life's material in a way that is conducive to, you know, the ox herding pictures or, or, uh, how he's come to view his life. Um, but I, I think it would be useful to like, maybe just start with like the, the opening paragraph, which is, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, fairly long, but it, it sort of lets, you know, everything about, um, uh, you know, how, how, how dense, you know, this text gets, right. How much you could actually get into just one paragraph. So the, it's first chapter and the, the, each, each chapter also has a title. And this one is my origins, 
presses of my education, my life at Cripplegate, and the agreement. Long ago, my father and I were servants at Cripplegate, a, a cotton plantation in South Carolina. That distant place, the world of my childhood is ruined now, mere parable. But what history I have begins there in an unrecorded accident before the Civil War, late one evening when my father, George Hawkins, still worked in the big house, watched over his owner's interests, and often drank with his master. This was Jonathan Pokinghorn on the front porch after a heavy meal. It was a warm night. An autumn night of fun spine moonlight blurred first by Madeira, then homebrewed beer as they played rummy, their feet propped on the knife whittled porch rail, the dark two-story house behind them, creaking sometimes in the wind. So in terms of like describing the physical structures, like I, I feel like very often you'd find, and you see this with a lot of like 1800s you know, novels, tons and tons of over description of like sheer physicality. This is right. really the, the most of what you get in terms of the physicality and then any, anything else that comes uh, uh, out, you know, as a result, you know, there's a more kind of, I guess, psychological reason why, why it appears. Um, my father had finished his chores early for he was, he says, the best butler in the country and took great pride in his position, but he wasn't eager to go home. He stayed clear of his cabin when my stepmother played host for the ladies' prayer circle. They were strange, George thought. Those women were harmless enough by themselves when sewing or cleaning, but together their collective prayers had a mysterious power that filled his whitewashed cabin with presences. Shades, he called them, because they moved furniture in the cabin, destroyed the laws of physics which George swore by, and drove him outside to sleep in the shed. Not that my father knew a whole lot about physics being a slave, but George knew sorcery when he saw it and kept his distance. He was, as all Hodges knew, a practical, God-fearing man who liked to keep things simple so he could enjoy them. He was overly cautious and unnerved by little things, so he avoided his cabin and talked about common sense things like politics and the price of potatoes on his master's porch long after the last pine knot candles winked out in the quarters. Whiskey burned and exploded like gas in his belly. His felt, his, he, he felt his face expand. His eyes, slow, his eyes slid slowly out of focus. Hard old leaves on magnolias overhanging the porch clacked like shells in a September wind sprinkled with rain, with rain. So here you get like a you know a few tropes already getting inverted. Um, you get like some inversions, uh, I guess, of like some, some gothic type descriptions. You get an, an inversion of like this, you know, the, the cliche of like the so called magical Negro. Mm -hmm. um, which you see like in very like pointless things. Like you saw, for example, that, that movie, I don't know if, if you're familiar with it. Uh, but I remember watching it as a kid, uh, the, the, was the legend of Bagger Vance with like Will Smith, like oh, playing yeah. the, yeah. playing this kind of, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, trite stock character, but here, you know, the, this, this, like this, like, you know, magical, uh, Negro sort of like caricature, uh, it's 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 used for a very different purpose, right? It's used to present the very beginnings of what's going to become later on in, in this book, uh, this like war between the sexes, right? Where mm -hmm. men are characterized a certain way, women are characterized a certain way, men in many respects are characterized as, as powerless, right? It's, it's very interesting how you know, how little power, you know, many of the, the men have in this text, right, compared to, you know, their wives or their girlfriends or whatever, or even like, you know, the images that, that men have of women, like later on, we have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Andrew's tutor, Ezekiel, you know, kind of like falling for this, you know, uh, plot uh, to, to uh, steal his money. And it all mm -hmm. has to do with like, you know, an image that he sees and falls in love with, right? So, um and, and you get like the first sort of hint, you know, there and you just wonder, okay, so if, th if this book was like 2,400 pages originally, uh, you could imagine like, you know, uh, uh, this kind of, you know, this sort of description going up further and further where, you know, we, we, ha we have more of this kind of, you know, these stock tropes being developed in different ways, but instead, you know, we simply have like a mere hint here, just like a few sentences about these women, you know, in their prayer circles and how this like blossoms into like something much, much deeper as, as the book goes on. 
Um, and, and then of course, just like, you know, you know, like, uh, I don't want to say generically great description because that's an oxymoron, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have like, you know, hard, hard old leaves and magnolias overhanging the porch clacked like shells right in the wind. Um, and, uh, as a description of drunkenness, his eyes slid slowly out of focus, almost as if you were the one watching his eyes. Right. Yeah. And, and they're kind of like blurring over with the alcohol that you're consuming. But in fact, you know, this, uh, uh th- th- this thing is, uh, you know, it's, it's just describing how he's feeling, right. His drunkenness and, you know, uh, it, in an odd way that again, kind of speaks to some of the ways that Buddhism gets used uh, as a trope, how it gets used formally, how it gets used in the descriptions, you know, like this kind of like, you know, um, collapsing of like subject and object, right. You know, subjects coming together, you know, uh, he's drunk, but you're also feeling a little drunk watching this description, right. You know, uh, about his eyes um mm-hmm. i'm not sure if you have anything uh, you want to say about like uh that that opening here but i mean there's a ton just in the first chapter that i'm sure we'll get to yeah no i don't have anything else to add there i think you summed it up well um did we want to read starting at the bottom of page five as well this other description of george actually going into the house but yeah, so so just um, so uh, everybody uh, knows that hasn't read the book. Of course, there's going to be spoilers of this thing. Like, and any yeah. and, and, and anybody that's like you know uh, worried about spoilers, you should uh, not watch this, and preferably perhaps not watch any of the videos on this channel. Because if you're the type that gets spoiled by spoilers, you probably shouldn't be reading books. Um, but so so like you know he he uh, so they're they're both getting drunk. And you see, like, you know, I guess women's power in this odd way kind of coming to the front there, right? Where, you know, Jonathan is saying, like, George, if I, you know, go to, uh, if I go to bed to my wife like this, meaning drunk at past midnight, you know, she's going to, you know, she's going to uh, physically fight me. And uh, George, uh, who's, you know, he's, present- <laughs> he, he's presented as uneducated, um, uh, instead of like verbalizing this, you sort of see this, like the, the thought kind of, you know, just settle on him. It says, because he had not thought of this, my father stopped laughing, then breathing for a second. Right. So like uh-huh. you, you get the same idea that if he goes home to his wife like this, he's also going to get uh, uh, physically hurt. Right. And their solution to this is to switch wives for the night, which if you think about it, it's like it's not, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a solution. You're still dealing with the same basic problem of a drunkenness a past midnight. You're just adding an additional kind of um, element to it, which I mean, it, it, it's, it's a co- comic element. But the, th- the thing is, like in terms of like getting back to like the physical reality of what slavery, you know, was, uh George could never have had this thought come into his head expressed to Jonathan, right? It takes Jonathan, the white master, to be able to ever propose, you know, such a such a weird thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it is proposed. And first of all, that emphasizes, you know, implicitly Jonathan's power, right? It, it's a comic event, but there's also very clearly Jonathan's power. You don't necessarily totally get the sense whether or not George himself really wants to go through with this thing uh but he he sort of does it anyway and i'm not sure if you want to take take you said bottom of page five you wanted to uh uh uh, say something there yeah well i'll actually start right above that with this quote from polkinghorn uh because so he's proposed this and and then it says george gave him a look he was sure it was the gin not jonathan talking george whenever I advance an idea. You have a most annoying way of looking at me as if I just suggested that we strangle a child and sell its body to science. No good will come of this. Good night, Jonathan said, steadying himself with one hand on the porch rail as he stood. He rocked off for George's cabin. I'll see you at breakfast. So, I mean, just that one little snippet of uh, dialogue made me laugh, you know, from from Polkinghorn, where he's like, mm-hmm. he, just, he just knows. He already knows it's a terrible idea and, and they're going to do it anyway. Um, but then this is, you know, more, more humor and more great description. So how long George waited on the front porch, sweating from the soles of his feet upward is impossible to tell. My father seldom speaks of this night, but the great Swiss clock in Jonathan's parlor chimed twice and in perfect submission to his master's will, he turned inside and walked like a man waist deep in weeds 
down a hallway where every surface, every shape, was warped by frail lamplight from Jonathan's study. His master's house was solid and rich. It was established, quiet, and so different from the squalid quarters with vases, a vast library, and great rooms of imported furniture that had cost the Polkinghorns dearly. A house of such heavily upholstered luxuriance and antiques that George now took small mincing steps for fear of breaking something. In the kitchen, he uncovered a pot of beef on the table, prepared a plate for Maddie. He always brought my stepmother something when he worked in the house, wrapped it in paper, drained his bottle of gin, then lit a candle. Now he was ready. And then he, he goes upstairs to Anna Polkinghorn's chambers and, uh, and hilarity ensues. And, and she thinks that he's actually Jonathan and they sleep together and then uh, she gets pregnant and spawns Andrew. And yeah. so uh, it and, goes and, on and, from there. And I, I, I think the funniest part in, in, in the first chapter is uh, after, so after uh, uh, George is uh, having sex with, with uh, uh, Anna and she kind of screams uh, Jonathan's name, George stops and he says, no, ma'am, it ain't Jonathan. <laughs> and then she's like, George, her voice pulled at the vowel like taffy. She yanked her sheet to her chin. Is this George? Your husband's in the quarters. George was on his feet. He's uh, with my wife. None of it made sense now. How in God's name had he gotten himself <laughs> into this? He went down in all fours, holding the plate from Maddie over his head, groping around the furniture for his trousers. Mrs. Pokinghorn, I can explain, I think. You know how a little corn can confuse your thicket? Well, we was downstairs in the porch, you know, drinking Master Pokinghorn and me. So then Anna screams, and uh, this is uh, the the origin story of uh, of Andrew, right? Who's you know half white, half black, um, and kind of is, uh, I guess, uh, partly because like Jonathan, he is never able to have kids anymore. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there was like some uh, problem, or it's because now like their you know marriage is now kind of like ruined. Anna uh, goes and she sort of lives in one section of the house. He lives in the other section of the house. Uh, they don't seem to interact much anymore. Um, so uh, Jonathan, like, sort of recognizing that you know this is kind of like as close to a son as he could get. You know, in a sense, like shared with uh, uh, with uh, his slave George. Um, he gives him a lot of like, you know, uh, preferential treatment, right? He, he educates him. He hires a, a tutor for him, uh, which uh, yeah. the rest of the chapter sort of uh, uh, goes into. Um, and, 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 you know, you don't exactly know where uh, Maddie, which is uh, uh, George's wife, you don't know exactly where she gets some of these like other uh, ideas or why she acts the way that she acts. But, you know, perhaps it's, you know, because of this this incident this hurts her, their marriage but she uh, also uh, seems to take on this kind of you know um a uh, uh, quality of like trying to always keep george at a distance and uh kind of lording over i guess uh, I, I maybe you can't say her own education but you know her her mode of being which she cons considers like more cultured and educated and just better right for example she's a vegetarian um uh -huh. uh, o o over george but uh this is kind of like so this is the origin of of, of andrew right and uh he uh, uh and uh, it's it's not directly stated but it but it's sort of you know implied that he looks you know wide enough that he could easily pass and this is what he essentially essentially does later on in the in the book when he when he leaves the plantation um uh was there um was was there like something else like did, like did, like did you have like any questions about like I guess maybe some of the like just 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 the fact that you know Andrew seems to have all this detail like like what does that mean for the story like what does that mean for you know maybe maybe the techniques like you know a Andrew could not have been around uh, uh, during these events but the fact that this is all all in his head already regardless um, like I mean did, did that uh, say anything to you or 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 what. Um, not a lot. I, I guess I didn't think about it too much because he does say after that whole series of scenes ends that this is his father's version of the story and it was told to him and, and he was never able to hear Anna Polkinghorne's side of, of the story. Um, 
so he kind of acknowledges that you know it's likely that even his dad is embellishing certain mm-hmm. things or, or or whatever and then of course um as we all do we can assume that andrew's filling in some gaps for himself or um playing up certain aspects of it playing down other aspects of it as as, as he now kind of knows that that's what went on um so no i i didn't have a whole lot else to add uh to that portion of it i think it you know, it's, it's interesting how quickly this whole first chapter moves along because then, uh, you know, here on page 11, page 10 and 11, we're introduced to Ezekiel Sykes Withers, who's to become Andrew's tutor. And uh, I, I do think it's worth saying before maybe start talking about Ezekiel too, just one of the other interesting components of, of the entire book is what you just mentioned, where uh, Andrew is, you know, white looking enough to pass as white. And so it's another way, uh, maybe even in which some of the Buddhist ideas mm-hmm. kind of come through here because he's bridging both races, uh, right? Mm-hmm. You know, he, he knows that he's mixed race and everyone who knows him knows that, but as he begins to meet other people uh, further into the tale, they can't tell and they take him for white and he does a great acting job and, mm-hmm. and just runs with it. Um, but it's, it's maybe an interesting additional bit of commentary there from uh, from Johnson or just a good good choice character wise that it's also interesting that this is uh, ostensibly a slave narrative but it's with a mixed race slave who's the the child of a wife of a slave owner and plantation mm-hmm. owner and yet he still has to be on the run he still has to flee uh you know even though he in a way has some he's born into halfway into privilege um but he's never accepted anna you know dismisses him from the get-go she factors into his life essentially zero percent mm-hmm. uh, from what we can tell here and so um yeah i just i thought that was it, it's a humorous choice it obviously gives us an end to these funny scenes and everything else uh but it's it's also a bit of a philosophical choice on johnson's part to have andrew be mixed race here rather than just a slave child who mm you know, happens to maybe educate himself and he's got wit and he's, he's able to kind of like conjure these things up. Like he's, he's given a a full education here, you know, Mm -hmm. by Ezekiel and and it frames up so much of what comes in the rest of the novel. That's, Mm -hmm. um, that's just different and interesting. So. Yeah. That's a good point about, uh, you know, the fact that he's half white, uh, this does play into, um, you know, some of the Buddhist, uh, uh, you know, draw, drive, drive in the text. Uh, another way that it does that though, is, um, so w- when he passes for white, right. It, it's not, uh, it doesn't seem like it's just that he's kind of being able to like bridge worlds, right. And become like, you know, a, a part of, uh, of the kind of like a broader universe, right. A part of just, you know, apart from just his race. Um, he starts to become, you know, uh, through through no fault of his own, right? I mean, if he's kind of like a slave on the run, you sort of have to do this. But uh, and that's kind of like you know, going back to like the world of sam- samsara, right? Where uh, he has to become over invested in the white portion of his identity, right? right. He has to take, he has to latch onto it, right? In this kind of you know almost anti Buddhist way, he has to hold onto it as as tight as he can and not let go because this is the thing that is uh, generating any sort of protection from, you know, the authorities or from the soul catcher. And in fact, like the soul catcher, he actually uh, uh, seeks out, you know, uh, anyone that is so overly invested in being something, right? Uh, and mm-hmm. and w- one thing that he says later on in this one great passage that we'll get to, I guess, uh, closer to the end of, of the show, uh, when, when the soul catcher um, says that, you know, a, a slave on the run craves exactly what the poets hate right which is mediocrity right they don't want to be average but a a runaway slave needs to be mediocre um and that is also you know kind of investment right and of course like you know in the kind of like in a wider common well why talk about this you know this book was written in the 1970s uh why talk about it then well you know, uh, you have all sorts of other things that people, you know, invest in themselves in, right? Uh, uh, protection, right? By beating, by being mediocre, right? I mean, you know, like you, you definitely see people, you know, uh, throughout history that 
could have done more, decided not to, right? They're focused on medi- mediocrity. You know, why, 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 why can someone like Trump, right, get into office and, you know, be in a position to like absolutely change the world, change the two party system? And instead, he just takes like the easiest ways out. He wants to be as mediocre as possible. And people do that, you know, in other ways, right? Whether it's like, you know, writers that give up writing, say, you know, it's too, it's too hard or it's too this or it's too that. Um, so you see throughout this kind of like, you know, implicit commentary on human behavior more broadly, even if you take it out of the context of, you know, slavery or other kind of like, you know, uh, examples of uh, the most uh, brutal of brutal experiences that people could have. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite, you know, think too much about the passing for, for white, but, you know, it obviously is, is much more than just a plot device, right? There is a philosophical heft that informs, you know, the, 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 the form of the book, right? The, uh, you know, some, some of the other artistic choices that were made, um, and yeah, there, there's probably not t- too much more to say about uh, chapter one, uh, but I have one, if you have nothing else, I just have one more quote um, to, that I could get into if. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So uh, on the bottom of a, a page 10, um, uh, when, sorry, this isn't page 10, uh, page 16, when, you know, Jonathan, not Jonathan, when when Andrew goes to Jonathan and, and tells him, okay, so. I, I want my uh, release papers. I want to go, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, work uh, for my wages and, and, and buy uh, Minty, buy my father, buy uh, my mother or his stepmother, rather, Maddie. Um, and Jonathan says, you know, I don't think you're ready. So after, you know, I guess the years of preparation, philosophical preparation, other forms of education, you know, Andrew has this kind of like sense of exactly why he wants to leave slavery, which, you know, to me also just kind of like, it, it just kind of strikes me as, you know, it's, it, isn't it so interesting how you could have a character that gives an explanation for why he wants to leave slavery that is anything other than the most obvious, you know, truth that, that, you know, pretty much any slave would latch onto, which is like, this is unjust and I simply don't want to be a slave. Uh, there, there, there's really nothing more to say, but you know, by function of his kind of uh, privilege, right? Kind of like being in between these two worlds, he has this kind of like more elaborate, right? Uh, uh, justification for for wanting to leave. And, um, you know, perhaps this, this also speaks to some of the kind of like personal overinvestments that he makes into himself as, as the book goes on. Uh, so after he asks Jonathan to, uh, if, whether he could leave the plantation, my master was silent so long I could hear rain patter lightly against the window panes. Make no mistake, that night I trembled. A pulse began to throb in my temple. Beneath the sausage-tight skin of slavery, I could be, depending on the roll of the dice, the swerve of the indifferent atom, forever poised between two worlds, or with a little luck, a wealthy man who had made his way in the world and married the woman he loved. All right, be realistic, I thought. Consider the facts. Like a man who had fallen or been rudely flung into the world, I own nothing. My knowledge, my clothes, my language even, were shamefully secondhand, made by and perhaps for other men. I was a living lie. That was the heart of it. My argument was, whatever my origin, I would be wholly responsible for the shape I gave myself in the future, for shirting myself handsomely with a new life that called me like a siren to possibilities that were real but forever out of reach. Um, so this is, uh, uh, and you know, like in an odd way, like you sort of see this in, um, you know, for example, like in, in I don't know, like in in uh, Great Expectations, right? You know, a pip sort of like you know, escaping the, 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 the wide world, right. To, you know, take responsibility for his own life. You know, Andrew has the same set of privileges where he could philosophically set in this kind of, you know, you know, personal quest, right. It doesn't have to be merely uh, the, the runaway slave narrative of other runaway slaves, right. He could embroider it with all this extra stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, like, you know, this extra stuff, it, adds to the richness of the book, the rich, richness of the character, but it's exactly this embroidery that he needs to kind of escape, right? He needs to 
Um, and he, he ultimately like lives essentially by the end of the book, you know, almost by accident, right. By the function of like his, his friend Reb, right. Who's, who's able to escape their embroidery or rather not really have much of this embroidery to begin with. Um, so he, he gets sent to uh, work, uh, with, uh, uh, Flo Hatfield, another, um, uh, I'm not sure if it's a plantation, but it's like another, it, it's another kind of, you know, slave owning house, uh, a 40 year old widow who seems to have like the same kind of function that, uh, uh Kamala has in the, um, in, in, in the novel, uh, Siddhartha, um, by, uh, um, uh, 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 Herman, Herman Hess, Hess, Herman Hess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I'm a, I feel like I've been talking a, a lot here. Uh, maybe you could take like chapter two and 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 what this does, like function, whatever you you, you found interesting there, because we we seem to have in our notes like different um, like different uh, highlights in terms of quotes. Yeah, well, I, I just think that the final comment I'd have on chapter one is uh, again, it's um, it's just a different setup here because Andrew being being mixed race and being george and anna's son uh is even in a position to feel bold enough to ask for his release mm -hmm. early um and that maybe that would be granted right mm -hmm. so again it's just different because instead of one night deciding this is it you know i'm just gonna run and mm -hmm. whatever happens happens he's 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 educated. He's he's uh, you know privileged enough to be able to even have the thought that that could be an option for him to mm -hmm. be released. Um, so it's again just sets things up differently. But now he's um, it, you know in a way kind of has to go continue to pay the price. Um, and and so now yeah we go to Flo Hatfield's estate um, and we're introduced to her. One of the you know, again, one of the things that uh, I wanted to call out here from chapter two is he continues, uh, Andrew continues to talk about uh, Ezekiel's tutoring of him, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so all the things that he's learned and kind of what he's bringing along with him. But um, on page 29, 29 to 30 here, um, he describes like another setup of, of Ezekiel and a conversation with him in his quarters and um, I think there's just some interesting commentary here that sets it up before he meets Flo. And so um, on page 30, Andrew asks Ezekiel about his parents' death. So Ezekiel earlier in the book talks about how his, his father, who you know, loved all the good things of this world and seemed like uh, just a typical laborer, kind of went insane and killed his whole family and himself, uh, except for Ezekiel. And so... Andrew asks him uh, on page 30, was it really an accident? I was now sitting on a milk bench, your father. It was, he said, and it wasn't. Lamplight threw his shadow and mine high against the wall. His nose was lit by the glow of his pipe. My father was no fool. He never wanted pity. He didn't want to die, Andrew. When I found my parents dead, I wept, of course, but only briefly, because my grief, it struck me, was a ghastly pose. Mere histrionics cliched outrage when the situation called for something else. Do you see? Yes, I said quietly, but I wasn't sure. My father's need for consolation did not dawn on me or anyone until it was too late to console. This is the way with all suicides. Because we didn't listen well, or Lord knows what, he shambled home after work and shot himself. Ezekiel blew his nose. After a moment of silence, he said, my father spent 12, maybe 15 hours a day in a brass foundry where I was employed for a time when I was 15 and for a pitiful wage. If all he could expect was poverty, if I say, Andrew, all he could see ahead was 60 years of bad news, the breakdown of his family, debts and disappointments, without hope of change, without consolation, wasn't it better to be done once and for all with all the person feeling, eh? It is not easy to be a full-grown man, Andrew. We are not like women. He swung his eyes toward me. We are weaker. Weaker? It made no sense. How are we weaker? Spiritually, I think. Perhaps all philosophy boils down to the simple fear that the universe has no need for us. Men, I mean. Because women are, in a strange sense, more essential to being than we are. Have you never felt that? Don't you feel oftentimes that we have been banished from the earth? 
that we approach the universe as an adversary because she turns her back upon us. And then he, he kind of goes on and talks about the Eastern stance of, of uh, men and women and this kind of thing. So, um, you know, two quick thoughts on that passage, you know, number one, um, it's, it's an interesting little bit of commentary there from Ezekiel about his father and his family's working class status, which sort of sets up very nicely the later interaction with Karl Marx, mm -hmm. uh, right? You know, and, and these comments on the working class and uh, kind of the humorous exchange, but also serious, I guess, uh, that takes place between Ezekiel and, and Karl Marx, uh, which we'll talk about. But then there, you know, also talking about the, the differences in his opinion between between men and women and like this, uh, this way that men are disposable and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and women are more, you know, close to the essence of being. And then as Andrew gains favor with Flo and becomes her, you know, her butler basically, and, and kind of manservant, but also lover and, uh, all these things, you know, he, he obviously learns more about, uh, about sexuality and about, himself and about being and, and some of these different concepts that Ezekiel is talking about here. Um, but, but yet, you know, Flo Hatfield herself as a character is um, she, she, she doesn't really fulfill this vision of, of what womanhood is that Ezekiel talks about where it's, mm -hmm. it, it seems, you know, more, um, more essential and, and kind of more, uh, cosmological in a way like Flo is is this larger than life character but she's also uh, she's so vain and she's so vindictive and she's just really kind of seeking um you know pleasure and, and fancies herself an amazing mm -hmm. you know amazing person in a lot of different ways where when you compare her to some of the other main female characters in the in the novel they're um you know they they have more uh, redeeming qualities that she does, you know, mm -hmm. she's, uh, she's really kind of insufferable, uh, a lot of the time. And so Andrew kind of works his way into her good graces and does everything asked of him. And, and there's a lot of very humorous, um, scenes between the two of them, even though they're always tense, you know, there's still mm -hmm. always tension. Uh, but Andrew talks about tension and his learning from flow of like the importance of sexual tension with pleasure. And, and so that kind of pinballs around in, in their relationship mm -hmm. and his whole time, uh, you know, at her, I guess at her estate is much more tense than it was at, than his time at Cripplegate, right? Mm -hmm. There's just this constant sense where like a bit of doom starts to creep in, uh, in all of his interactions there and in his attitudes there. Um, and then obviously, you know, I'll let you maybe run with it from here for a bit, but, um, Patrick, her previous butler and lover, who's the son of another worker on her, her estate, Reb, the coffin maker, uh, who kills himself in like a really kind of violent way. And, uh, is this kind of horrible event that Flo just moves on from immediately and mm -hmm. is like, well, Andrew, you know, we're subbing you in, you're, you're now my full-time everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so Reb has to go bury his own son and, uh, you know, seems to hate Andrew, uh, at first, but then kind of gives some deeper explanations of his real feelings and attitudes mm -hmm. toward Andrew that are different than what we might expect. And, um, so yeah, do you want to pick it up from there? Yeah, you know, just a couple, a uh, few comments there. Uh, so uh, the way that, you know, Patrick gets, uh, uh killed, right. Or uh, he kills himself. Um, essentially, you know, like over flow, right. And, and the fact mm -hmm. that flow seems to be already showing some preference for, um, uh, for, for Andrew, uh, that, that speaks back to like what Ezekiel, Ezekiel said about, you know, the expendability of men. Right. right. Um, right. and, uh, I actually, uh, I, I forgot that I did this, but when I uh, reread this now, uh, this may be my third or fourth time, uh, reading this book, uh, I actually use that passage where Ezekiel uh, talks about um, uh, men versus women in, in this way. I use it as a kind of like, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, epigraph um, when I was doing a, uh, my essay on like red pill ideology versus like feminism. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, I used it because, you know, it, 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 in this book, like when Ezekiel says this kind of stuff, it's not that it's necessarily wrong. I mean, I, I, I guess uh, 
I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, phrase things exactly the way he phrases them, but um, it's more so the fact that let's say that he latches on to an objectively correct, you know, set of facts. Um, let's say that his theory about, you know, men and women in this regard is correct. Uh, uh, to him, like it, it's, it's not enough for it to be correct, right? Uh, for the facts to be merely as the facts. Ezekiel has to then use this theory as just this like elaborate justification for why he's like, you know, antisocial, why mm -hmm. he's disconnected from the world, why he's not able to build, you know, healthy relationships with people that actually do matter, right? People that do violate i guess some of some of this theory like i've always had this idea that you know um you know anybody that i would marry like it can't be you know a stereotypical woman and you know like uh i would never want to be a stereotypical male i never simply want to fulfill you know the kinds of functions that ezekiel is spelling out in this theory right i want there to be something more if i as a male am ex expendable biologically speaking what can I do that is not expendable about me? Well, you know, one answer is the arts, right? Uh, and there's like many other answers that you could come up with. And Ezekiel never tries to come up with any of these answers at all. Um, and the reason why I, I use this uh, epigraph uh, in, in my Red Pill essay is, although yes, it is partly a critique of, you know, modern feminism, it's much more so a critique of Red Pill ideology, which is like, you know, the most toxic, form of like reaction to 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 the problems with modern day feminism right it's you taking at face value ezekiel's theory and because you don't have truly anything of value to offer you simply then become like the sum of like exactly what like you've been told you are which is you know like in red in red pill ideology you know men want to like you know constantly increase their sexual value by like i don't know you know they want to work out you know make money and, you know, date women that are, you know, very stereotypical in the sense of like, you know, everything that, that fits their kind of like a notions of how men and women ought to behave. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I call this like very offensively, um, a very vaginal view of history because, you know, men that behave in that way, they, they, they want, they do it because they, you know, th they want to feel like they're attached to like all the positive elements of masculinity, but instead they're simply taking on, you know, all these assumptions of uh, assumptions of like expendability, which they say is dictated by women. They're taking at a face value and they refuse from cowardice or inability or whatever else from like pushing forward and doing any, anything bigger with that. Right. And I saw that in Ezekiel when I first read this text, which is why I use it ultimately for an epigraph on an essay like that. Right. And and you just see this throughout. Right. Where, you know, but both men and women here, like they have power. Some don't have power. There is this kind of interplay with power. But, um, you know, in both cases, like it seems like men and women all together in this book, they don't really have a true sense of self. They don't have a true sense of also, you know, the possibilities behind beyond the self. You know, what does a typical red pillar know uh, beyond, you know, uh, the very basic issues of sexual conquest and the self always like ego, 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 right? It's always like full, mm -hmm. it's filling, you know, the same kind of function. Um, so, so, so yeah, like that, 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 that also was a passage that I highlighted that I wanted to, to, uh, to read and yeah. And, 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 you know, uh, Kamala, uh, like you mentioned, like she, she, she doesn't fulfill, you know, any sort of ideal functions uh of a woman right only only the kind of like you know all, only like in the most stereotypical sense right w w what is you know a liberated woman in the most stereotypical sense well the stereotype would be uh much of what you see you know from kamala but you know it's not that she herself is a stereotype like she has enough depth to her right that she at least kind of alludes to she constantly, like, it seems like some of the stuff that she says about philosophy or history, it seems like she wants to escape these, like, little behaviors. But, I mean, you know, she's essentially a lotus eater, right, to, to use the, you know, the, the, the Homer phrase, right? Um, she's in the world of the senses, right? She's so kind of, you know, obsessed and fixated upon, um, you know, sexuality and, and, you know, essential pleasure. And uh, at some point, Andrew, when he... Um, when he decides to uh, 
you know, comment on this. He, he, he says that it's not that she's um, uh, uh, this bottom of page 43, despite her plain talk about pleasure, she was not sensual. My mistress was too obsessive to be sensual. The erotic difference between my minty and flow, it seemed to me, though I could have been wrong, fooled by first impressions, was the difference between growth and decay, the spirit flowering and efflorescence, and the spirit so paralyzed by past pleasures, impoverished by desire, that now it needed the most violent stimulants to register sensation, right? Which, you know, it, it captures uh, essentially kind of like, you know, um, uh, what 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 Kamala is to the text, right? What she is as a character, where she is in the kind of you know world of samsara. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's that's all well summarized. Um, I was going to jump ahead to page fifty five, which is chapter four. So I, I mean, I kind of oh wait, be, 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 before you do that, did you want to say anything more about you? You mentioned briefly. Um, because I had this written down, maybe you have some comments. Uh, so like when George is being taken to this, I guess, let's call it a plantation. I forget exactly if it's a plantation. Uh, as, as as George is taking um, Andrew there, uh, we, we hear this story about um, Ezekiel's teacher, right? What, what was his name? Oh, yeah. Trishanku. Uh, yeah, yeah. Trishanku. Uh, do you want Do you want to talk about that parable? Like I, I, I thought that was a very nice... Um, a little like twist, right? That kind of come. It does come to control, like much much of the text, right? Um, yeah, sure. So um, we we can chat about it, maybe rather than like reading it, because it goes on. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's for no, a while. I, I don't think there's a reason to read it. Yeah, yeah, but it's uh, it's in the, the pages 32, 33, 34. Um, is that run for anyone um, looking through the their copy? So. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's um, maybe a slightly different take on something like the the parable of Job um, in the Bible. There's some similarities, there's definitely some differences too, because uh, you know here, Trishanku is essentially um, asking the god Brahma about wisdom and and the seeking after it and, and how to attain it. And so, uh, it's it's kind of a funny story because Brahma says, "Well, you know he." he resists and says like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. You know, you're not ready for it. And Trishanko continues to, uh, to plead with him. And finally he says, okay, well, uh, you know, go get me a cushion, go get me a, a pillow that I can sit on, on the earth next to you. And, and then we can start. And so as Trishanko sets out to find a pillow, um, some shenanigans happen. I mean, basically he ends up meeting this woman and falling, uh, you know, immediately in love with her and, um, sleeping with her and so then they have a family and like he ends up living this complete cycle of like a typical human life where he becomes successful in business he raises this big family he's well respected in his village all these other things go on and then eventually the ganges floods and wipes out everything that he had worked for and kills his entire family except for him and so uh, you know at the end of all of that he once again uh what does he do i mean does he ask brahma like why that why that had happened or I, I forget what essentially but then um yeah he cries out you know lord for he now drifted toward a cliff with a hundred foot drop lord but he was not even sure that he wanted to live and instantly the flood was gone where the remains of magada had stood there was brahma in a sea a miracle of light he was a little impatient now tapping his foot trishanku asked the most high where is my pillow? Mm -hmm. And then the next line is, wake up, Hawk. George elbowed me. We he a son. Mm -hmm. So they're at, at the plantation. So uh, there's both like a parable that Ezekiel had told to, to Andrew, but also a dream that he had had here, uh, you know, reliving that on the way to Flo's estate. So um, it is, it's, it, it does set up, it, it seems at the moment kind of just like um, a little, you know, moral tale or something that that Andrew is kind of reflecting on, but it ends up becoming the structure of a lot of what happens from here in his own life. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's 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 a good little, you know, good little uh, moment there that that pops up and um, just just kind of funny the way that you know if, if we ask or seek after something like wisdom and you get distracted and you do all these other things and then eventually you come back to it and it's like yeah you know 
whatever mm-hmm. source in this case brahma you know that you're looking for it and it's like well i, I continue to be here you know the, this whole time you've lived a life i've just kind of been waiting for my pillow mm-hmm. um so yeah it's a good moment in the text it reminds me of this one uh i, I forget exactly what the story is but it, it's like a taoist uh story um of the uh, there is a, um, there's a sorcerer, right. Who sort of like presents all these images of life, right. Also kind of like samsara, um, uh, uh, to like a, a, a person that is kind of like asked to sort of like sit around and, and, and meditate on it. Um, and ultimately when he sort of cries out and, you know, the, these images, right. Uh, uh, dissipate, right. This is, th- 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 this was supposed to show right uh the errors up until um you know that time right this is a concept of samsara you 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 get it you know in lots of different traditions right perhaps not in the same exact way but you know there, there's always a sense of uh wandering right how do you stop wandering this is you mm-hmm. know a direct question that is you know asked like almost verbatim by a couple of the uh, um uh, characters in, in in the text um and yeah, I, I guess uh, that's that, that's about all that I have for a flow and and that part of the uh, book. Uh, you said you want to jump to like page fifty or sixty. Yeah, well, we both had highlighted page fifty-five, which is where um, Patrick has died. Reb has built his coffin. It's the day of his funeral, mm-hmm. and so Andrew sort of uh, sneaks out of the house it's it's another interesting little moment from Flo where uh you know right before that mm-hmm. she has like had night sweats and some crazy dreams and um she i don't know she basically is kind of hallucinating mm-hmm. or something and so uh andrew tells her to go back to sleep you know it's it's again just like very callous uh in its dis- depiction of flow here right she she can't even be bothered she's way more bothered by the sun getting in to um you know interrupt her sleep than she is paying at all attention to patrick's funeral that's about to take place she obviously doesn't plan to be there doesn't care uh whatever so andrew sneaks out and i mean there's even some humor here uh you know in, in this description and this is one of the things I mentioned earlier uh, in the episode so far, but I also mentioned to you in my notes, it's like, this is just constant. And it's one of the things that makes the book so great is there's this line that keeps getting crossed very liberally by Johnson between comedy and tragedy. And it, it, it all kind of like works together. So on page 55, Andrew says, as she slipped back to sleep, I gently pushed the door shut, took the stairs two at a time, then stepped into a morning too bright for a burial. The whole day was in bad taste. I, that, like that line literally made me laugh while I was reading it because it's just kind of funny to think that you're on your way to a funeral and, and your thought is, uh, you know, this, this whole day, like, fuck this day. It's just, a, <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. in bad taste. But uh, the air, I thought, had no business being so crisp, the sky so barrelin, and nature so indifferent to Patrick's death when the voice of my education sang the earth as man's home, being as a vast feminine body, if poetic tradition was trustworthy, metaphors are fair. These rolling hills, these timeless trees and vegetation we genderized, even as we racialized being, giving them feminine attributes without asking whether being, like Anna Polkinghorne and my stepmother, bore an ancient grudge against men. Of course, William Sidney Mount painted her, Emerson sang her, Thoreau fled to her, Payne mystified her, but these were men. That morning, I thought this vision contained the menacing idea that men, not man in the abstract, but men were unessential and in the deepest violation of everything we valued in woman. What was said of woman was no less true of world. She did not need us for satisfaction or even reproduction. There were, after all, parthenogenones, all of which cast men as the comical exception in nature, the luxury, the freak who fell back on thought in the absence of feeling created history because he could not live beings timeless cycles on my way to the hills i entertained nervously pulling at my fingers the possibility that the sexual war was a small skirmish a proxy war with women as the shock troops for a power that waited mocking the thoroughly male anxiety for progress ready to smother the fragile male need to build temples to the moon ready as in patrick's case to remind us without hope of redemption 
that though men were masters, even black men in the sexual wars, we could not win. Clearly, I was in foul spirits. <laughs> so there's that whole like big philosophical rumination, and then uh, he just chimes in, "Yeah, obviously not a good not a good day for me." Um, and then he proceeds to uh, to observe the funeral, and then the, the vet um, creeps up on him and scares him to high hell because uh, he doesn't know he's there, and they start to have a conversation, and things go from there. But uh, any comments you want to make on that section? Yeah, um, I, I, I forget where I heard this comment, but, you know, somebody uh, like had this, I forget who said this, but somebody was like, well, uh, why don't we have a female, you know, uh, Jack the Ripper? Um, and uh, somebody said something like, well, it's perhaps for the same reason that we have, you know, only like male Mozarts. Uh, that doesn't strike me as necessarily, you know, uh, fair. Um, and you know, with enough time, this is, this is eventually going to flip, right. We're going to get that much awaited flippening. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's, you know, it's this idea that men are, you know, they're, they're putting themselves on the line for, it could be an abstraction. It could be a, a something else, but you know, like women are always like somewhere in the background. Right. Um, and He's he's feeling this especially now because you know this is like this this is the second so there's like two chapters that are titled uh, in in the service of the senses mm -hmm. and like he just sees like so much of himself like already slipping away right he sees uh, his, his actual um, you don't you don't even have to say identity right uh, uh, you you could take this kind of like non Buddhist approach but just you know the stuff that he does right if you just want to say that he's merely the sum of what he is and what he has been doing you know he he's kind of you know grown up just you know being educated you know he he's he grew up uh reading he grew up just kind of you know thinking about the world in you know uh deeper ways and now uh in some ways like this is just getting cooked out of him right in the realm of the senses right he's um you know he, he's not allowed to 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 uh be that and uh, the one exception, so like we kind of like sk skipped a little bit ahead, but Reb later on in the text becomes more and more important. Uh, mm -hmm. This character, and that's, that's another like bit of like interesting characterization, right? It's like this minor character that is just kind of there as a kind of, you know, annoyance at the beginning, um, a little bit of, uh, of a foil to the inexperience of, of Andrew. Um, but, uh, uh, Reb, he, he just gets more and more importance as, as the text goes on. And one time when Andrew is watching Reb construct a, a, uh, coffin, right. He, he comes up and he asks him about, you know, what he does. Uh, this is ultimately what, what Reb says. Um, so, so, so Andrew comes up and says like, each casket you do is different though. I said, there must be some technique. Right. So that already is like it's it's a little bit of a Buddhist uh, framing here. Technique, Reb laughed. You want to know what I do? I don't do nothing, fresh meat. Least ways nothing you'd understand. Before I even open my toolbox, I go off by myself into them woods yonder for a week. I try to forget about every casket I've made. After a day, I can't remember none of them. After two days, I forget whatever instructions the family of the dead person give me and whether they're going to like it or not. After five days, I forget the fact that I make coffins. Seven days go by, and I forget all about myself, and that's when I start looking around for a tree that wants to be a coffin. Um, and, you know, not only just like a, a beautiful description, but it's also, oddly enough, like a kind of you know, uh, it, it's a little bit of corrective to uh, the, the passage, the passage that you just read, right, where you have men like in this kind of proxy war. Um, uh, and and, and uh, this is uh, described as uh, uh, like ready to smother the fragile male need to build temples to the moon, right mm -hmm. there, you know, you, you kind of have this. You know, you're building a, a temple to the moon in a sense, uh, you because you want you know other people to look upon it, right? You want other people to have some sort of positive commentary about uh, anything that you have to do. I, I was uh, last week I, I read um, Schopenhauer's 
uh, the wisdom of life. And, you know, one of the things he talks about uh, when it comes to like human character is um, what, what, what one, one huge problem with like men's characters is the need for praise, right? Whether it's like true praise, whether it's incorrect praise, it's, it's this kind of like craving for praise. He gives an example of like this one guy that was about to be executed and uh, the thing that he hated the most is A, he wasn't allowed to shave and put on the clothes that he wanted. And B, he had to like, you know, get the crowd shortly before his execution on his side to praise him for his courage or whatever, right? This kind of like constant need for affirmation. Whereas Reb, when he's constructing these coffins, he says, there is objectively a proper and improper way to do things. There is objectively a greatness and there's everything that is below greatness. And in many cases, there is, you know, uh, in most cases, there is the opposite of greatness. There's what people want, meaning, you know, the family uh, of the, the deceased that are requesting a certain kind of funeral. And then there's what I'm going to make, what I think is proper, right? Uh, what I think is important, right? And I'm going to do it irrespective of what others are going to uh, say about this, right? So in that way, you know, although he seems to be, you know, sort of uh, uh, driven by the same male drive, right, for, you know, building temples to the moon to just create something of, of, of some kind of value by taking, you know, other people uh, as much out of the equation as you can. Um, he's able to escape this kind of, you know, uh, attachment to the self, to ego. He's able to uh, escape, you know, uh, uh, cravings, like, I guess, in the Buddhist sense. And he's all ultimately able to escape with his life when the soul catcher realizes that, you know, here's a man that does not crave. I said, mm -hmm. I would no longer, you know, uh, uh, go after anyone that lacks these craves. And here's an example. And yet, and yet he's doing it through like, you know, a small a art, right? He's, you know, uh, he is saying there are these objective metrics and we could respect these objective metrics and we could work in accordance to them. But, you know, we, we don't have to envelop ourselves with, you know, what other people are going to say or think, right? That, mm -hmm. that, that is the distraction. So, um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is, this is, this is um, well, thankfully, this book is not that long. So we could actually like spend a long time in each chapter like this and, uh, you know, um, not, not be here for six hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so my next um, highlighted portion was kind of a, a jump ahead to page 63, where Andrew gives some, um, some description of his sex life with Flo. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we even necessarily need to read through it. It's kind of a page 63 and 64. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it's, it's, again, just a, a really good mixture of uh, Johnson's sense of humor with uh, the, like the seriousness, uh, especially for flow of, of sexuality and like how, how high on her list it is, uh, you know, in this life of the senses that she lives. And, um, you know, Andrew's kind of ta just talking about how overwhelmed his senses are by the way that she needs to uh, basically conduct foreplay. And then the act of sex itself and how long it goes on for and um, all these different things. So it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, a funny passage. Um, and yet again, he, he continues to like ask interesting questions throughout that and, uh, and everything else. So I, I don't know if you have anything else to say about their sex life, but it definitely, you know, it kind of uh, makes you think and laugh at the same time as he describes mm -hmm. that part of his life or that, that season yeah I, I i mean he he's only able to sort of like get interrupted when you know he receives a, a letter from cripple gate indicating that you know the family was uh was sold yeah um and it unnerves you know, him a lot yeah and, and flo is just like well you know she wants you to stay with me so is that really so bad you know um uh because in, in 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 some sense, you know, the, he he recognizes that he has like these other responsibilities, right? But the fact that he's kind of passing for white here um, uh, allows him to escape some of these responsibilities. But there's always that that call, right? And and oddly enough, like it, it, it you know, part of the initial call is still tied up to you know the, the world of uh, samsara, but um, 
you know, by executing those responsibilities, he's then able to, you know, uh, I guess, uh, get, get, get past or tries to get past, uh, uh, some of the ego, but even after this, uh, flow tries to, um, uh, uh flow flow just tries to like you know keep keep him in and uh just in the next chapter is when we get the soul catcher for the first time yeah. as a character uh, uh appears um and maybe maybe real quick too before we talk about the soul catcher um one other thing that you might have mentioned earlier but that stands out about andrew's time with flow and at at her place is that uh, sort of similar to Cripplegate, you know, he once again gets this like non-brutal yet still brutal exposure to slavery mm -hmm. because in, in his own experience, um, he's in a very privileged position. I mean, he's mm -hmm. basically just her, you know, her, her booty call more or less. Um, mm -hmm. But she still has this like psychological power over him. And he knows that um, he, he's, he's not really, in any way free. I mean, in his mind, he's working toward his eventual freedom papers. That's why he's serving this time here. Um, but it's it, it definitely, as we go along, like both with the disposability of life that, that we see at mm -hmm. flows estate and just with Andrew's angst about like still being in, in this grip and he is still a slave, you know, despite yeah. everything that's going on. Um, his experience is, you can say arguably better than what anyone else on the plantation is having. And yet it's still slavery. He's still trapped. Um, and it's, it's really just a, you know, a punch the clock attitude for him to try to do this. And then, so that is also part of why he's so unnerved by the letter mm -hmm. from Cripplegate, because now it's like, well, uh, you know, the whole reason that I am here is, is now being undone and, of course, he begins to wonder what all has has happened. Um, so, it, once again, just a way in which this is Johnson is framing this up as a very unique take on the slave narrative, because our main character here is not just another field hand, you know, being constantly mistreated and and uh, everything else. Mm -hmm. Presumably, everyone else there is essentially, but Andrew's uh, personal experience is different. So, anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, then let's let's move on to Horace Band and the slave. Uh, the soul catcher who's you know an extremely interesting character yeah um so so uh, i mean uh, to me uh the soul catcher has like two functions right like well first of all we, we have like um you know th this kind of tension uh, within andrew right like you mentioned he's uh he's always uh in the kind of privileged side of slavery he's always a slave and he's always kind of like fleeing but his experience is kind of different. And, you know, from a purely kind of like fictive standpoint for a book like this, uh, especially for like a modern book, um, you know, it, it, it does allow kind of like more room for relatability, right? You see kind of, you know, uh, Andrew going through, you know, these sexual experiences that perhaps readers uh, can relate to a little bit, right? In a way that's different if it was just kind of like more, you know, generically sort of like uh, slave sexual experiences, um, and same thing with like the, the soul catcher, right? He, he fulfills two functions. One is like, you know, in, in the kind of like most generic sense in a slave narrative, you're going to get slave catchers, right? This is just a kind of like the, the br brutal reality of slavery as it was lived for, you know, uh, so many people, they had to deal with the, the physical danger of, if you try to escape, there are going to be these kinds of consequences. Mm -hmm. Um, on the other hand, because this is not a Christian redemption story, and this is not merely an abolitionist tract, uh, he has a second function, which is um, when he goes and he, you know, catches slaves, it's it's uh, also that he's looking for human beings that have attachments and cravings. Um, this isn't like, you know, this isn't like Johnson critiquing, you know, uh, slaves wishing to escape, like craving to escape slavery and so on and so forth. Um, he's more so kind of critiquing, critiquing kind of like more in the modern sense of like, you know, um, uh, if you are able to take away, you know, the, these shackles, right. Or at least is the way that I, that I read it. If you're able to take away shackles, if you're able to take away the most brutal portions of, of American history, um, what accounts for 
the cravings that still remain among people who are privileged, among people who are not privileged, right? You still have this, you know, constant, you know, uh, set of cravings. And, you know, the soul caster, he's, he, he, he's looking for human beings that have an overinvestment into, into this kind of self, right? And, you know, he's only able to catch the slaves and his experience thus far, it's everybody, right that that have these kinds of attachments right so you know um on the one hand yes you have the 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 the, the comment on the lived reality of slaves uh, needing to escape you know this kind of brutality and the people that pursue them but b you have that spiritual redemption angle right mm -hmm. not from the christian but from the buddhist perspective yeah well and one other thing that uh that i think is interesting about horace bannon the soul catcher is um he's uh he's such a fearsome character because as we learn more about his backstory uh as a youth and adolescent with you know a, a, a difficult uh, or even horrendous upbringing you know uh, abuse from his father and, and these other kind of things um he talks about you know trying to get to know himself or realizing what his real nature is and so it's a bit ironic where he he talks about being on the hunt for for people who want something and that's how he he becomes them and how he learns to know them better than themselves um but he himself has the craving to kill and he realizes this uh you know he he kills like some insects at first and then maybe uh, moves on to like small animals and then eventually people and, and so he you know in his nature uh, we should find the page because there's, you know, this whole monologue he goes on uh, with Andrew and Reb once he tracks them down where he gives them like his whole story. Uh, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, but, but I'm going to get to my point, which is that he um, begins to crave killing so much that he kills his own family. He desires then to be obviously hired to do this. Mm -hmm. uh because it's it's just what he does you know he found what he's good at and so he he's going to do it for a living but in a way um you know so he subverts himself because he obviously has this craving as well which is to to hunt and to kill uh but he's even though he's a fearsome character uh because he's he's so good as a bounty hunter he's also cowardly because you know, you, you kind of get the sense it's like, well, so in the end, like, you want to be a serial killer, essentially, this is your desire. This is what you crave. Uh, but you decide to be hired to do it by white plantation owners to go hunt down, you know, fellow former slaves and kill them. Like, why not become a serial killer of white plantation owners or something? You know what I mean? Or, or just like anybody doesn't matter who anybody i'll just go kind of like live in the shadows and pop up and kill when i want to and then fade away um so he's still like he's so loathsome for that reason you know in mm -hmm. a way right that he decides to just go ahead and enter the service of uh in this case flow and we're never really told I, I don't think he's specifically her uh slave catcher it sounds like he's just uh, he's a mercenary right he'll go mm -hmm. wherever and be hired by whoever um, but anyway, it's just something that occurred to me while I was reading is like, you know, he has this craving himself and also, uh, his cowardice, uh, really kind of comes to the forefront. And I mean, the, you, the, the, the second craving it. has to be, you know, money, right? I mean, there's no yeah, money yeah. in like hunting down slave owners, right? Uh, the money is all going to be in, in one part, which is hunting down slaves. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. so, you know, you, so he's, you, yeah, he still wants material well being for himself, you yeah. know? um yeah by by doing this work so anyway um were there spe like a specific set of um, passages you wanted to read about his introduction to um the book here uh well uh not really so much that i mean he, he's just kind of you know like you said like a fearsome figure that kind of you know comes out from the shadows and then he's formally uh introduced uh but i think more interesting also in, in chapter five is um you know kind of like and this is all related obviously to to uh the soul catch right because this is this is the the thing that saves reb so uh there's the soul catcher and then there's also 
the uh, Dr. Grohl, right? The veterinarian who, mm-hmm. uh, you know, vets are the ones that see uh, slaves uh, in, in the uh, 1800s. Um, and he himself is also, he, he's an interesting kind of like philosophical character. Uh, he has like some uh, uh, good passages, passages and, and things to say. Um, and it, it, in page 70, right. When, when Andrew is having a conversation with him about, you know, kind of like the, the, the nature of like the self, um, uh, Andrew asks how I asked, can a man stop wandering? And he answers, you need an unshakable faith, fiction or fact. It makes no difference. A life assurance that will place everything in proportion, including evil. The vet jabbed the air with one finger, especially evil. I've listed several on that paper. I unfolded the page he'd given me. Depending upon your ability to pay, Leviathan's veterinarian offered a series of values that, that brought a man peace. These he ranked according to price. They included one, the faith that someday you would be honored by your community for your contributions, $100. Two, that if not honored, your children would one day regard you as a source of inspiration, $75. Three, if neither of the above, you would enjoy the benefits of a good marriage, a little property, and pride in your work, $50. Four, if none of these then you would enjoy all the above plus life everlasting in the afterworld, $25. If none of the above, you would at least die mercifully in your sleep, $5. The last policy is lately our most popular, said Grohl. You have only to select a hope. Through the techniques of Frederick Mesmer, it will seem apodictic. That's wicked, I shouted. They're all lies. The vet nodded, sadly, in agreement. What value isn't? Um, and I mean, this kind of like perhaps I highlighted because uh, it, it also just like uh, goes back to some of the stuff that I've been uh, studying more recently, like, um, you know, the kind of like, I guess, grounding of values, right? If, if, we, if we're going to talk about the arts, right, if we want to ground uh, some values as preferable than others, um how can you do that objectively, right? When it seems like, you know, just kind of like a bottom line is that all values in a sense are lies, right? They're built on lies. Um, you just have to argue out uh, about uh, everything other than that baseline lie, right? But by, by having that, right, he says, whether it's fiction or a fact, right? Uh, uh, you could objectify the entire universe based on a fact. You could objectify the entire universe based on a fiction, um, for, for Reb, right. It might seem kind of, you know, like a, like a worthless activity, but to him, you know, he seems to be a, a great coffin maker, whatever that means. Um, mm-hmm. uh, that, that, that prevents him from the wandering, right. Ultimately, yes, he escaped slavery, but that's not the wandering, right. He's able to in more peace now do what he does best, which is, you know, without the, the, the kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, shackles, right, of, of slavery, right? He's able to do what he, what he does best. Um, and this is essentially what Andrew is is looking for. And, you know, it, I think it's kind of telling that at this point, part of the narrative, when he's still in danger, right, he says that that is wicked, right, because they're all lies. And he doesn't seem to really get how this is essentially, you know, no different than what he's doing, no different than what uh, most people do especially if they get to the point of, you know, actually arguing about values. Um, yeah. Well, um, um, I, I guess before we go further, we should just say that ultimately um, they, they uh, so, so, so like, you know, uh, Andrew ends up leaving Flo because like he just gets like too upset, you know, like one day, like, okay, I'm just so fucking tired of like being the world of the senses. Mm-hmm. So he just lashes out against Flo by like hitting her in the nose. He causes a nosebleed and uh, he gets sent alongside, I think with Reb to the mines, right? Where yeah. people go to die, right? They, you know, they get sil- uh, 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 silicosis, uh, you know, whatever, I guess what we would now call black lung disease. Um, and Uh so he, he, he is sent there, but interestingly enough, like that is framed 
by uh, it's called the yellow yellow dog mind it starts on page 79 but but that that chapter of like being in the mines he doesn't spend too much time in the mines it seems because he ultimately escapes but his entrance into the mines is framed by a memory that he has going back uh, with Karl Marx visiting mm-hmm. Cri- Cripplegate one day at the request of his tutor Ezekiel. Right, Ezekiel wants to meet Karl Marx. He's a big fan of his work. Ezekiel uh, considers himself a socialist, right? So he, uh, I think, he pays for a boat ticket there and back to America uh, for Karl Marx to to uh, visit him at at, at Cripplegate. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you have anything to say about the the intro to uh, to the chapter, but I have a, a couple of things uh, he, uh, listed here. Yeah, go ahead. Keep keep on moving. I, I this is a you know it's a good passage and it's uh, it's humorous. There's there's quite a lot here. So yes, yeah, so, so yeah, so like when they're when, when they're in the mines, right? And they're like, oh shit. So like you know, uh, what do we uh, what do we have to uh, deal with here? Um, uh, so Flo Hatfield's coachman, Sam Plunkett, um, I assume that he's also uh, black. Uh, so th- they're down the mines and all these people like they're, they're sort of like, you know, bullshitting about, you know, being kind of like at the bottom, you know, s- you know, being slaves in this kind of like a more brutal sense all of a sudden. And um, uh, he, you know, he, he points to the mines and uh, S- Sam, Sam Plunkett says, there, said Plunkett, looking back again, that's where y'all going. You finished, asked Reb. Why, yeah, Plunkett blinked. Of course, I don't approve of what goes on there. Oh, it's terrible treating men like animals or machines. I'm a socialist, he blurted. I'm on your side. You men should pull together. I mean, we ought to pull together. Plunkett tugged at his collar for air. Reb asked, how come? Because Plunkett was sil- silent to spell. Because all property is theft. He pulled the phrase around him for protection. I had this line underlined from when I first read this book years and years mm-hmm. ago, um, because I remember like when I used to be a Marxist, right? This to me, was like the, you know, the, the knockout argument against everything, right? All property is theft, right? Mm-hmm. So I would also pull the phrase around me for protection. And it's like th- this book is not, you know, it's not a book about these sorts of politics, but like, you know, uh, Charles Johnson is able to like capture that, that portion of like, you know, uh, socialist psychology, Right. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when it comes to, you know, kind of like, you know, a uh, uh, liberal white, you know, kind of like, you know, a socialist psychology, right, where you don't have to deal with like the worst of the world's, you know, um, uh, 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 issues. Right. But uh, uh, you yourself are able to still, you know, get something from this phrase. Right. You're able to use it as a kind of like psychological self-defense. Mm hmm. Your stolen property, improving a little on it now. And me, I'm stored on rental terms, like a cabin. You look at Reb. That doesn't work, does it? Not really, said Reb. Well, snorted Plunkett, you get the idea. The people on the bottom belongs on top, which to me, it's like, you know, this kind of captures like so much of, you know, it's not fair to say like social psychology in general. It's not fair to apply this to Karl Marx himself, right? He's characterized very differently in this book. But, you know, just this kind of idea that, you know, to lots and lots of people, right, I'd say even maybe perhaps to the majority of people that call themselves uh, uh, Marxists, um, it's not simply that they want, you know, an end to exploitation. I think, you know, tons of people, they just have this like Nietzschean slave morality, right? Or perhaps more more accurately, it's, you know, Nietzschean uh, resentment, right, where, you know, uh, he says the people at the bottom belong, you know, not, you know, equal with everybody else but on equal, top yeah, on top yeah, yeah. right you know, the people at the bottom belong on top when of, when of course the reality is you know uh, uh in this kind of system right if, if this is the paradigm that you're after there is not supposed to be a top there is not supposed to be a bottom but um you know uh, you you get tons of like people you know in a room right the average person uh this is exactly how how they feel and interestingly enough like so this is kind of like you know uh, he's in a mind but after like a couple of pages of this sort of description um immediately we get to Karl Marx's arrival at, at Cripplegate and uh, Karl Marx is characterized very differently from Ezekiel, you know, Ezekiel also being a socialist. Uh, Ezekiel, though, because he's so disconnected from society, he's so kind of like apart from the world. Uh, when he talks to Karl Marx about, 
you know, his own philosophy or the stuff that he's reading, stuff that he's uh, uh, writing, um, uh, 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 Eze- meaning like Ezekiel's own papers, uh, he's like, he gets kind of annoyed or perhaps like more so he, he's, he's hurt by the fact that Karl Marx is not really into uh, Ezekiel's philosophy. He's not really into uh, the things that he's a publisher or, or wants to talk about. Mm-hmm. And uh, when Ezekiel explains his disappointment at this fact, he frames it as, well, you know, I, I would just hope that you, Karl Marx, would understand what I'm talking about because, you know, there's a certain kind of like lower class of people that just would never appreciate this. So, you know, even if Ezekiel had worked at a foundry once, right, even if Ezekiel had to deal with like, you know, uh, the, the problems of growing up in a working class family, being so kind of like, uh, you know, head in the clouds, essentially, right? Um, he's able to disconnect himself even from his own past, right? He's able to kind of like say, like, um, hey, you know, like I, I, I now know I am no longer a lower class person, right? Even if financially I might be in the same situation, I know, I know better than they do. And Karl Marx, won't you join me, you know, in this kind of way of viewing the world? And you know, Karl Marx says no, you know, um, I, you know, uh, uh, I, he, he, he doesn't say this himself, but. You know, Marx is presented as someone that loves life, right? He he laughs mm-hmm. a lot, right? He he loves to actually talk to working class people. Uh, he has this kind of like humanism all about him. This book that he's like, you know, writing as he's going to Cripple Gate, that's still kind of like in the notes stage. Um, he says that he was thinking about banning it, but you know, he came across like some some woman on his way to, to, Cripple, <laughs> yeah. to Cripple Gate. And because like he found her so kind of like, you know, evocative and beautiful, now he's going to not only finish the book, but he's going to dedicate it to her. Yeah. Right. Um, and this just kind of shows how like, you know, how, how, you know, how connected he is to, to the world and to others, which Ezekiel in being a socialist, um, he, he's not able to do that. Right. To him, socialism is a kind of weapon, right? It's a way to sort of hit people over the head with, right? It's not, you know, it's, 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 it's not a means to necessarily advance society as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we see this essentially where, when Ezekiel, you know, he, he, he takes, you know, he, he's so kind of shocked at Mark's criticism of, of, of Ezekiel, uh, that, He's not even able, it seems, to like take Marxist words uh, seriously, right? He, he's only able to take it in, a, in the most literal sense possible, where it's like, okay, so if Marx is dedicating this book to like this, this girl that he sees, I am now going to dedicate my life to not even a girl that I see, but like a picture of a girl that I see, right? Yeah, uh, I, I I have been stingy my whole life. I've not been, you know, good. I am now going to make amends by this this random woman, you know, that I see in this kind of, you know, like uh, this photograph. Um, uh, I will now kind of like dedicate my work, you know, going to debt for her, and this kind of opens himself <laughs> him up to like you know being taken advantage of, right? And um, to get to like the to to, to get to he has this like really nice um um. Uh, thing about a uh, charity right where yeah when he's interacting with uh, shem moses at the tavern yeah. and shem shem's like this drunkard yeah. you know low life who althea is yeah presumably his daughter or the that's the the girl that he has a picture of that ezekiel is uh, struck by and so then yeah they have a dialogue here about yeah ezekiel's and, motives yeah yeah and ezekiel is basically like you know um you know, he, he, he says, you know, I don't want the photo back uh, and it's for the girl, not you. If you spend it on drink, I'll see that your daughter is placed in somebody else's custody. Right. So he, he gives money to this guy. Right. Uh, the hired man bobbed his head. Thank you. No, thank you. He picked up the girl's portrait again. Can I keep this for a day or two? You ain't with the law, are you? No, I'm a teacher. Why did you ask? Moses released air in relief. He began to pick at his nose. You a real Christian, Mr. Sykes, and we will pay you back, Lord willing. And he had one boot out the door before Ezekiel could reply. So ostensibly, um, uh, this this guy, Shem Moses, just ends up like spending this money probably more on like drink or whatever. 
Um, and uh, then uh, uh, Andrew starts to characterize this this interaction between them, which again, it's like you know, how does he have such an insight into uh, what goes on here? Right, this it's it's supposed to be a first person narrative, and right. and, An and Andrew says. It was, of course, neither Christian nor charitable from Ezekiel's point of view to give his July wages to the hired man. It could be, he thought, after Moses left and he again sat alone, staring at the girl's portrait, seen as the most self-righteous and therefore suspect thing he'd ever done. There was in every gift the feeling that you had overpowered another, performed a service that in the gaudiest sense displayed your superiority or use their suffering to assuage your guilt or to buy yourself a seat in the sweet by and by. Um, and this is just, it's just so true of charity as a whole, right? Um, uh, th th this idea of like, you know, giving money that you're, you're not being forced to give right uh, to someone instead of like, you know, obviously the most, uh, you know, the best state of affairs is you have a state that, you know, takes, you know, without people's permission, uh, what is necessary to redistribute as needed. Um, and instead you have this kind of, you know, you have these like charity organizations you have uh, today, we would have like, you know, tons of like uh, not-for-profits and, you uh -huh. know, they just fulfill this like very uh, odd function of just like, you know, assuaging um, a guilt, right? This um, it, in the most recent essay that I just finished, I mean, the first thing that I put on the auto machination website, which should be up, um, a week after this this uh, artifact episode is up, uh, you know, I, I sort of talk about this, right? Like, it's just, you know, it's just the means of, you know, people that don't have a, a, a connection with others, right? Like, this could very easily be a way to, like, buy them off, right? Like, instead of, like, you know, spending time with people, instead of, like, you know, taking time out, instead of physically having to be present, if you're someone like Ezekiel that could have access to some money, um, you know, he, here's a way to sort of like, you know, do that in lieu of actually, you know, uh, getting any sort of like connection. Because when you think about it, when he, you know, tells uh, Shem Moses later on that, hey, I want to, you know, buy your daughter off of you so she doesn't have to live in this way. Um, the fact that this is done simply and purely on account of like a photograph uh, it shows how kind of like, you know, sexually mature he is, how emotionally mature he is, how, um, you know, just, 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 just the fact that he's like, he's not able to cultivate any true meaningful relationship. So he tries to like buy a relationship. Right. And in uh -huh. his perspective, like, you know, I guess it's not, not the worst thing that he could do, but, you know, is it really that different than like buying a slave? You know, like it's yeah. true. It's true that you're not going to, you know, shackle this woman if you have access to her. But, you know, you are kind of like buying, you know, you're buying her affection. And like, what is she supposed to do? Like, it, like, she like, she's gonna feel like she owes you something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, there, there's this kind of like, you know, shackling. And it's just so interesting how like, you know, he like, Johnson has his commentary throughout that, you know, so Ezekiel, you know, working class background, he could easily be in a situation where he has some kind of sympathy, right, or some empathy for for you know people that are enslaved, um, and in a sense, like th this this girl would be like in this weird way enslaved, and uh, uh, ultimately, like when he like comes up with this money, goes into debt to do it, uh, Shem Moses says, okay, so sh you know, take this trip out to this house, and uh, you know, uh, my my daughter will be waiting for you there. And this is how this gets described. Um, he hitched wagons to Greenwood, bought a bouquet of flowers, then hiked six miles to the farm. And this wearied him, for the wind was strong and stirred red dust. The path was uneven, the footing poor, with night coming on, and he painted and powdered as he was, wearing his high hat, his tight square-toed shoes, and carrying a walking stick, was not dressed for hiking. First, he saw a porch sharking onto the yard. A wild pig scrambled down the steps, cutting dirt across the fields. Something clicked in his throat. His stomach turned. He took off his hat and stepped inside to the shock of rooms emptying into rooms. Each step on the old floor was like the crack of a coffin shrinking. The farmhouse had not been inhabited for years. Ezekiel looked in the kitchen, the study, the sitting room, no Althea, 
only this toadstool smell floating over black, dark furniture, broken lanterns, roots bursting through the floor, birds nesting on the chimney piece. Curtains moved behind him and he turned around. Rats, he sobbed his first sound, dropped the flowers, then his cane, crumpled at the room center, his back against the barrel, the shadowy house quiet now, a bony ruin where the only movement was blood pounding in his temples, his heart overheating, searing pain in his chest, and then even the work of this bloody, tired motor went whispering to rest, his spirit changed houses, and he dropped into the solitary darkness like stone. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, like, this 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 house is just kind of like, this is his disconnect from the world, right? This is no different from um, uh, everything else in his past. And, you know, it, it doesn't change the calculus simply because he's able to go into debt, right, to, you know, try to buy the affections of another. He still has no way to connect to the world. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there's a couple thoughts that come to mind with like this whole interaction. Um, so one is is a couple other parallels from the text. So first would be Ezekiel's father's suicide and the effect that that had on him and the way he describes it early in the novel. And it makes you wonder in a way if, uh, because we're not told through Andrew's recounting here, really um anything about ezekiel's inner life and inner psyche about all this and on the one hand we could assume that he's he's just this naive mm -hmm. and this one time that he attempts to go make a real connection in the real world and uh, put his his means toward helping someone tangibly it just goes this wrong and mm -hmm. and it's sort of a, a tragic thing on the other hand maybe he is committing suicide in a way. Maybe he kind of knows that there's a good chance this is all a fraud and he's being taken, but he keeps pouring money into it and he keeps pouring himself into it so that if it turns out to be that fraud, he could just, you know, die from it, basically. Uh, we, we don't really know. And so there's, there's maybe some kind of parallel with his own father's um, decision-making. There's also then later, and you highlighted it well, uh, this moment where Andrew has the means or, or thinks he can get the means via his future father-in-law to buy Minty from a, a backroom slave auction in Spartanburg, which we'll get to here in a little while. And so uh, exactly, you know, I thought there was that parallel between Ezekiel trying to buy off Althea and then Andrew trying to buy Minty later. Uh, two different scenarios, but they they have similarities to them. Mm -hmm. Um so, you know, definitely that, that all kind of comes up and, uh, and, and then, yeah, the, this whole idea of, uh, of charity and, and like whether Ezekiel's doing the right thing or he's just doing something self-serving and, um, and again, you know, maybe kind of knows that in a way and hates himself for it, or it, it's just, yeah, it's an interesting set of psychology and it's a really interesting end, um, yeah. Because you know, I, I mean, these characters life. are not, you know, these characters are not villains, right? No. Um, but, you know, they, they just get so much extra depth and complexity, despite being, you know, like I, I, I mentioned earlier, like very Dickensian characters in the sense of like, you know, very like odd little qualities, right? Like Ezekiel, like we, you know, we couldn't, we don't have time to get into all this, but, you know, there's like a couple of pages of, of description of like Ezekiel's like little mannerisms, yeah. all the things that make him tick, right? That, that, that make it memorable, right? That's a classic Dickensian touch, but you don't get, you know, the same kind of psychological insights, right? Uh, that, that you would get in this book, right? And, and all these characters essentially have a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and once again, you know, just, beautiful few paragraphs of writing mm -hmm. there flat out yeah. you know it's just kind of what we said about uh, the best of john williams abilities in in certain passages of stone or you know we've we're trying to highlight obviously things mm -hmm. that are important to the narrative but also just some of these moments are so well written um and that's you know that was one of the passages that stood out to me mm -hmm. upon a reread here as um just really really excellent writing on johnson's part as a as a you know, closure on Ezekiel's character mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah. So 
Um, let's go to page 115 because they, this is where basically um, they end up around the campfire in this conversation with the soul catcher, which of course, um, at first they don't realize it's him. Maybe Reb does, Andrew doesn't. And then, um, and then they both kind of realize it. So yeah, I think we both agreed that um, page 114 to 115 has maybe the soul catchers, you know, best or top, top two, top three, uh, you know, monologues here. So do you want me to just go ahead and maybe read what yeah. he says? Okay. So he says, um, <laughs> something in me lifted this is page 114, 114, something in me lifted my left hand to my shoulder to strike Bannon with my other hand. I lowered it as one might press down a mechanical thing on haywire and said to keep this wild man calm. We all have our work, I guess. Indeedy. He sucked his teeth, and it wasn't afore long that I came to see that the world would always have need from a specialty. There ain't many men what can catch or kill a Negro the right way. There is, I ventured, a right and wrong way to this. The soul catcher reached for his jug and poured three fingers of warm whiskey into his cup. Leaning back against the log, he rubbed his legs to start blood circulating again. A last rush of Chandu locked in my system, inactive until now, chose that moment to come to life, doubling my vision for an instant, twinning Bannon in the trees behind him. Time dissolved into a deeper silence, the universe breathing outward, a god's exhalation in sleep, then in pointlessly. It was as though we were the last men in the world, survivors of a holocaust at Hegel's end of history, trying to figure out what went wrong. And then the soul catcher laughed. You don't just walk up to a Negro, especially one what's passing, and say, ain't you master so-and-so's boy? No, it's a more delicate, difficult hunt. Here he stared into his cup. When you really after a man with a price on his head, you forget for the hunt that you the hunter. You get up at the crack of dawn and creep over to where that Negro is hiding. It ain't so much an overpower in him physically when you hunt in a Negro as it is mentally. Your mind has to soak up his mind, his heart. Here he shogged down a mouthful of corn and cringed. The Negro hunt depends on how you use destiny. You let destiny outrace and nail down the Negro you after. From the get-go, hours of four I spot him. There's this thing I do, like throw him a voice. I calls his name. The name his master used. Andrew, I says, if his name be Andrew. Andrew. I stiffened inwardly but gave no sign. My feelings and my voice fly out to fasten on to that Negro. He senses me before he sees me. You become a Negro by letting yourself see what he sees, feel what he feels, want what he wants. What does he want? The soul catcher winked at Reb, who was brutally silent, chipped from stone. Respectability. In his bones, he wants to be able to walk down the street and be unnoticed, not ignored, which means you've seen him and looked away, but unnoticed like people who have a right to be somewheres. He wants what them poets hate, mediocrity, a tame teacup pass an uneventful life, not to go against the law, but hug it, a comfortable, hard work in life among the many. Don't seem like much to ask, do it? This he put to Reb, my friend did not answer, but this too was an answer. It wears him down, you know, invest in so much to get so little, it starts showing. You look for the man who's police in his self, trying to le his level best to be average. That's your Negro. Here he held his cup in both hands. You nail his soul so he can't slip away. Even for he knows you've been watching him. He's already in leg irons. When you really onto him, the only person who knows he's a runaway, almost somebody he can trust, you tap him gently on his shoulder and he knows. It's the call he's waited for his whole life. His capture happens like a wish, something he wants, a destiny that comes from inside him, not outside. And me... I'm just God's instrument for this, Master Harris, his humble tool, and I never finish the kill till the prey desires it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like we've kind of touched on different points of, of this before now, but um, this, this whole idea of like, you know, someone needs to have cravings and then eventually want this as their final craving, you know, to, to be killed, caught and killed, um, by him. So thoughts on that section. 
Um, well, uh, I mean, I feel like we we uh, touched on what this means for kind of like the narrative itself, but like g going into like the present day, w w what do you think this could uh, refer to? Like, w what are like some present day analogs, right? Where, you know, people uh, crave mediocrity. I mean, I, I mentioned one example, right? Where, you know, th there, there is this thing, right, with people of talent who don't necessarily want to exercise those talents because it could be, difficult it could be in some way i don't want to use the word destructive because uh, it's ultimately not but uh the, i guess destructive in the sense that if they have other aspirations right talents uh, oftentimes get in the way um like well, what do you think this that all this could refer to like beyond the like one-to-one -one, uh thing of like you know this is a slave narrative and this is uh therefore a slave catcher um or or did you like not get that sense when you were when you were reading this yeah, I, I don't know that I necessarily thought about it in that way um, when I was reading it, but um, yeah, I think that your idea is a good one. I, I um, you know, in terms of of someone with talent, you know, kind of striving, striving eventually for mediocrity because it's the easier choice. Um, I, I, it could, I mean, in the sense, in this like overarching Buddhist sense as well. Um, that Johnson's using here, and, and maybe this would just reply, apply to any sort of um, like spiritual element in life. Uh, and I would even argue uh, pursuit of, of knowledge and like, you know, non-spiritual like wisdom and discernment in life. Um, I think it could be that too, where, you, you know, it, it takes a lot more work to, um, to really try to get at things and to to examine them and, and like come to your own conclusions. Uh, whereas, you know, I think a lot of people are, are more than happy to just kind of be, uh, you know, caught if you will, by, uh, uh, by like prevailing wisdom or just a lowest common denominator take on, on a lot of aspects of life. Um, mm -hmm. and, and like, that's, that's what a lot of people, and end up desiring in a way is just to uh, like to not ruffle feathers and just have kind of a, a made uh, like a TV dinner, um, you know, set of beliefs and set of working principles that like they think is helping them live their life. But, you know, really there's, there's just not much there there um, or that's unique to them. I don't know. I'd probably have to think about it more. I mean, that's, what do you think? That's, that's one other thing that comes to mind, but yeah, I mean, the, the the first thing that came to mind was, you know, uh, just, you know, a, a, any sort of like denial of, um, you know, a, a, a nature that is built for something a little more than mediocrity, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I guess, you know, for me, like art would be the easiest thing to sort of, you know, find an analog in. Uh, but, uh, you know, I suppose you could find uh, 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 other things that are kind of, you know, perhaps a little more prosaic. I mean, pretty much anything would work, right? Um, and, and, I mean, like a couple pages later, right, uh, after this monologue, um, you know, Bannon sort of like lays out this system, right? So since there is this system for him to live by, uh, there's a way to sort of sidestep it to avoid it, right? Ultimately, he does not, for example, catch Reb as we'll get to, mm -hmm. um, this is how, how Andrew characterizes it when he sort of recognizes that perhaps there is like a, a way inside this and to, you know, a short circuit his plans. Um, yeah. If the coffin maker had not been convinced before that I suffered brain damage, now he was sure. And for all, by the way, this is bottom of 117. Um, mm -hmm. Now he was sure. And for all I know, that may be the truth of it. For I found the soul catcher's modus operandi reassuring. Because I knew his techniques, the strategies that poisoned my father, I could stare them down, second guess Bannon, and escape destruction. This struck me as a more certain course, a greater triumph than following the North Star. The man did not, on principle, act until a runaway lost hope. This was the origin of all error, and haplessly lay his head on the block. Bannon could not, given his code, the aesthetic laws he lived by, interfere. And sir, if he was fool enough not to interfere for whatever reasons, what in this world could I not accomplish? So, I mean, ironically, he's sort of, you know, thinking uh, uh, for himself, right? What, what can mm -hmm. I not accomplish? You know, this has like shades of like, you know, even beyond 
r- running away as as an ex-slave um you could see this like you know perhaps referring to other things in life post slavery um but although he kind of like sets this up for himself he ultimately does not come to these uh you know that this the, 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 he he does not necessarily meet this goal right it, it is ultimately reb who is able to do that for him right like it's it's i i think it's an open question at the end of the book whether or not uh the slave catcher would have uh actually killed um uh andrew right like it's 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 not a hundred percent clear it's not entirely clear that uh andrew was able to uh do what reb did right which is kind of like escape uh his ego is it's escape the kind of paths that he has become over invested in outside of like the path right we we never really do get a sense of the path other than ultimately he does seek some sort of uh domesticity in his life mm-hmm. um he does want to buy you know the uh former uh slaves that he grew up with he wants to buy his family right he has this kind of a uh, uh, goal goal in his head but um but, you know and, and we're not ever sure wh- whether whether that's enough right that that part is never clear um so he kind of you know he kind of it's 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 this thing where you would expect in the slave narrative right like okay he's laying out this plan and you know near the end of it he's going to he's going to make it and he ultimately does make it but not uh by the mechanism that he suggests here right it's not purely uh through through his own effort right mm-hmm. um so you know a lot of this is accident i mean you know uh, so here they they're they're escaping the mines and they are just kind of um uh uh you know like they're, they're sort of wandering around and you know reb uh he he intends to go with andrew but andrew just kind of like leaves him right when he um is about to uh, get married right because uh, in some senses like he's been found out by this new family uh, even mm-hmm. if not completely all the way right he realizes that he can't go with reb and you know that is like a circumstantial thing that is an accident um uh who knows uh had it turned out a little bit differently whether or not you know reb would still be alive but you know i i i just get the sense that um these these plans that andrew makes for himself uh they are they are not the the plans that ultimately do what he expects them to mm-hmm. um yeah there's definitely um a, a bit of a a nature of uh of happenstance uh, of course as well yeah because he has he's he's good at uh, th- sort of thinking on his feet you know and coming up with some of these mm-hmm. roughly sketched plans uh in any given moment um but then it you know life happens to him and so he he begins to react and has to sort of live in that river and and figure out how to navigate it as he goes along um you had mentioned in your notes that you maybe wanted to read this inter- intermission chapter chapter 8 on the nature of slave narratives did you want to read that or did you just want to discuss it for a minute um maybe we could like sort of do that at the very end right okay. um because uh, you, you also highlighted that as, as a subject to discuss and maybe some yeah. of the kind of like more meta uh narrative this 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 uh belongs to me a little bit better um okay well so then you know he they're in spartanburg south carolina now mm-hmm. and um you know andrew and reb are still sort of together in a way um and it's it's sort of interesting because the the physician in Spartanburg that Bannon, you know, the soul catcher decides that Andrew should see is Dr. Undercliff. Um, so he, you know, he goes there and we kind of get this introduction to Undercliff who uh, is, you know, one of, if not the wealthiest, uh, you know, person in all of town. He has like this beautiful house and mm-hmm. obviously basically has a monopoly, uh, it would seem on treating people there. And so, um, you know, he begins this kind of tete-a-tete a little bit with Andrew and realizes he's he's clever and he has an education and, um, you know, Undercliff is assuming he's white, you know, has no no real knowledge about his true background at this point. And also, uh, important to note, Andrew is running under the name William Harris at mm-hmm. this point, right, and has uh, has had a different name for a while now. 
So Undercliff knows him as William Harris and um, Undercliff has this daughter, Peggy, who's, uh, you know, seems kind of like a, a bookish brainy woman and uh, hasn't really found any suitors in town, mostly because she's unimpressed, it would seem, uh, you know, if anyone who comes around, but Andrew, due to his quick wit and his education and, um, you know, maybe even to a certain extent, his comfort with women, especially after his, you know, sexual encounters with Flo and everything else, and like how he loved Minty in the past and whatever, like he doesn't, um, you know, he's not a prude and he doesn't have uh, really any hesitation with flirting a bit. So, so they flirt and Peggy takes an immediate liking to him and Undercliff notices this. And so uh, pretty quickly, you know, they, they begin to, to court and see each other and then um, things kind of move along. So Undercliff decides to, uh, how does it go? He, he basically, they know that Evelyn Pomeroy, who's been a, you know, the main school teacher in town and also is an interesting minor character because of her, uh, you know, mostly failed life as a writer. Um, you know, she's old and leaning toward retiring and they need a different teacher to take over. And Andrew basically seems fit for the job according to Undercliff and um, decides that this is a way that he can enter the white world. You know, he can pass uh, as white and he's got this education that allows him to basically jump right in and um, and begin teaching and earning some wages and things kind of move along from there. Um, one funny little thing to call out is like page 122 when he's uh, given this, you know, this, this little uh, letter or page of a book by Dr. Undercliff. It's from Benjamin Franklin's autobiography and how he, uh, <laughs> he like checks off every day what of these virtues he does well at. Mm-hmm. And so this, this is like a really clever way that Johnson gives us a, a good succinct in to Undercliff's character, you know, even as a minor character is which virtues he considers himself to be achieving, you know, not at all or moderately or extremely well um, any given year or any given day. And I actually laughed out loud again at this chart when I got to the bottom and his, he checks off chastity for every single day, um, which I don't think at this point, maybe we do. Do we know that his wife is, you know, he's not married anymore? Cause I, I, I guess I'd still, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't remember seeing her. Maybe, maybe uh, she died. I forget exactly if she was ever even mentioned. Um, yeah. Well, so there's, there's the little discrepancy because Peggy states that she died, but mm-hmm. oh, yeah, another, yeah, yeah. another right. townsperson sa- says, or maybe it's Evelyn Pomeroy actually, who says that, no, like she ran away with a different man. Yeah. Years yeah, ago. yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the, again, it's just funny, you know, like there's these funny moments uh, in, in involved, but like, yeah, when I read that, I was, I think I was still assuming that Undercliff was married at this time, yet chastity is checked off every mm-hmm. single day. Um, so it, it, it made me chuckle. But anyway. I mean, it's, it's also funny, like, even if he's not married, like, it would be a virtue based on what? That, that you have no mm-hmm. no access to sex? Like, yeah, ex- it's, it's yeah, not exactly, exactly a virtue. Um, yeah. So um, so anyway, kind of fun, some funny moments there. But um, things are kind of moving along. And, like, it, it gets to the point where Undercliff basically says to Andrew, like, you're the only man that my daughter has ever taken an interest in. Uh, you need to propose to her and I will make your lives easy, more or less, uh, mm-hmm. as long as you, you know, marry her and remain faithful to her. Um, and you, you guys can do what you want other than that. But uh, it all happens, you know, quite quickly. And so then we get to the moment eventually where, like Reb realizes that Andrew's now stuck in Spartanburg, you know, Mm -hmm. he's going to be there and he, he either won't or can't go any further uh, on the path toward freedom. So Reb just decides to set off and instantly this like, you know, makes Andrew just sink because uh, you know, his guilt complex is kicking in in an extreme way. Now, you know, he's like leaving, it feels like he's leaving Reb to the soul catcher to just be, you know, brutally murdered at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, He also feels like he's betraying his father, especially uh, by passing as white and not, you know, ever attempting to correct anybody on that or fleeing with Reb when he probably 
should have if he was to honor his father, which gets to another interesting thing maybe we want to talk about about George Hawkins uh, briefly, which is that he obviously, uh, you know, toward the end of his life, really ramped up these feelings of, um, you know, in a sense, like self is need needing the story of his own um sacrifice and and his own difficult and and terrible station in life as a slave and in the history of his people also mm. having been subjugated that way and so it's it's an interesting um psychological thing because andrew kind of comments on it and, and he just more or less matter of factly reports it but also questions that attitude, which is again maybe a unique thing in a in a slave narrative book like this, where uh, George isn't really praised for having that chip on his shoulder uh, and carrying that attitude around. It's it's more questioned and kind of like you know, um, was that the right thing for him to do, or was it really just sort of a you know a, a proxy for developing any kind of selfhood um, that where he could be you know a stronger stronger person? So. Did you want to comment on that a little bit? Well, I mean, like e e even uh, some of his, like, uh, I guess you could vaguely call them politics, right? Like early on in, in the book when, uh, so like George gets like an, an added little like splash of dimension where, so in the first chapter, right, we have uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the birth story of Andrew. Um, and, uh, the next time you see, you see George, he's, you know, he's, he's taking Andrew to, uh, uh, Flo and on the way there, he just, just sort of gives him like a set of instructions, like, you know, do not pass for white, right? Uh, everything that you do needs to sort of, uh, move the race forward, right? Anything mm -hmm. that you do could either have the effect of moving the race forward or, or keeping us back. So don't pass for white. It will all sort of like catch up on the end. And, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, beyond like whether or not it's, it's dangerous, right? This is just kind of like philosophically wrong. He doesn't say it exactly in those terms, but this is what he's getting at. Uh, but he sort of, you know, he, he sort of like peppers those kinds of uh, kind of uh, more more kind of specific pragmatic statements with, um, you know, commentary about like, you know, like a rising Africa, right? Like it's just almost like proto black nationalist uh, uh, type discussion that, you know, Andrew just like hears and he's like, OK, like I've heard this like a million times already. And, yeah, um, yeah th this is also kind of like, a, I guess, the chip on on uh, uh his shoulder and he's he's kind of gently you know uh to the extent that this is part of like you know charles johnson's like you know uh authorial voice uh it does seem to be a critique right of of george uh of george's politics maybe this specific manifestation but um like his his wisdom in other ways uh is is still you know usable right especially by the uh -huh. end of the book it, it clearly is but you know the the, pol the 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 politics, right, and the anger, and the fact that this is just part of this rage that doesn't add to anything, right? Um, you know, uh, just go going back to like when the book was written, like you know, you definitely had you know strains of this in various like uh, you know black nationalist movements, and you know many people did you know uh, make fun of that, like you know Black Panthers being you know, kind of like, I guess, more classical Marxists, uh, they had, you know, little patience for stuff like black nationalism or Africa is going to rise again, or even, you know, this idea of like any sort of, you know, affection towards like a, a continent that you never had set foot on. And what are you going to like, you know, do this thing where you're going to, you know, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the word is because it's not orientalized, but you're kind of like self-orientalizing yourself like in reverse, right? You know, mm -hmm. I need to have a special kind of connection simply because of my color, despite the fact that for all, all intents and purposes, like I am an American at this point, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you, you definitely get these dimensions in, in George's character. And because again, because it is a, is a fairly short book, you know, they do come in these kinds of splashes, right? Unexpectedly and every single time, you have like a little bit of an added depth uh, to the character. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so then from there, you know, we're moving toward the wedding scene, which I think we said we wanted to read in full real quick before that. Um, I just wanted to maybe read from page 143 where Peggy. Well, I, I have something even before that. Oh, you do? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so um, this is uh, this is after uh, uh, Peggy and Andrew meet. They're clearly sort of you know uh, falling in love. 
um, and he already took over uh, the the job, right? So he's already teaching, and this is right before um, Reb. Uh, so like, so this is like a couple pages after Reb uh, and Andrew decide to part ways. Um, uh, a Andrew says, "You're wondering, I imagine, about the differences be in the white and black worlds." Uh, this is page one thirty two. Uh -huh. Well, here is the first. This feeling in both that the past is threatening and the black world a threat because there is no history worth mentioning, only family scenarios of deprivation and bitter struggle and failure against slavery, which leads to despair, the dread in later generations that they are the first truly historical members of their clan. And in the white world, the past is also a threat, but here because in many cases, the triumphs of predecessors are suffocating, a legend to live up to or to reject with a good deal of guilt, the anxiety that these ghosts watch you at all times, tisk tisking because you have let them down, a feeling that everything significant has been done, the world is finished. An especially painful form of despair, I thought, and I admit to suddenly despising Edwin Harris for placing this burden upon me, although I had spun him from my imagination. No matter, I felt uneasy. Um, and like, you, you, you just get this uh, sense over and over again that, although yes, this is a slave narrative, obviously you're going to critique the white world. You're going to critique those that stand by and allow you know this element, namely slavery of the white world to just continue to transpire without too much pushback. Um, there's, there's, there's always this kind of like, you know, like, like, like Johnson is, is constantly trying to find parallels between black and white, right? Uh -huh. uh, even in, in a character like Ezekiel that is so kind of, you know, uh, disconnected from his like kind of like newfound privilege. Um, he, he's made to sort of like feel something for the black world simply because he grew up in poverty. He grew up with like a, a family, perhaps not in the same kind of uh, problems that uh, slaves experience, but, you know, poor having to work at a foundry. He watches his father. Okay. So his father is not uh, a slave in the, in the technical sense, but he is kind of like a, a wage slave, right? 12 to 16 hours a day uh, mm -hmm. in a factory. Uh, father dies um, and, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. So there's this kind of connection uh, uh, here you have like, you know, like, um, uh, men and women, right They're They're presented a certain way. There's a lot of philosophy about being male, about being female, but both of them are given a kind of like, you know, uh, set of like protocols and, and set of like lines to like find, uh, empathy with. And here you have the same thing again, like you have a conception of black history, you have a conception of white history, and both of them are said to be taxing and it's not even like you know it, it's not it's not that one is necessarily privileged over the other it's not that one is necessarily said to be you know more difficult or worse or whatever but uh still there's this kind of like attempt to form this uh camaraderie right um uh, be uh, between the two and um you know th the fact that this could come up again and, and again and again in something like a slave narrative that is another kind of you know trick that is another inversion right mm -hmm. of um you know certain tropes and and expectations yeah um good so yeah i mean then, then um moving forward just this this quick little bit on page 143 i i won't i don't think i'll even read it because it is uh, it's most of the page but basically just an interesting moment where um you know peggy and andrew are now married and she's kind of talking about how absurd their wedding was and she doesn't like to be the center of attention and all this kind of stuff. Um, but then she goes on to talk about Evelyn Pomeroy and how she had met Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, and then Evelyn Pomeroy, you know, wrote a parody of Uncle Tom's Cabin and on and on and on. And so like she, she basically is just very upset, Evelyn is, um, that like her talent level doesn't match her vision as a writer. Um, uh, maybe I will just read a couple lines right at the end here. So she says, 
Um, she told me she couldn't admit that for years, that she belonged in the audience, cheering, not on stage. It was tantamount to confessing she was beneath the beauty of fiction, maybe even beneath Stowe. Can you, Peggy asked herself, not me, still love and believe in something when it's so beautiful it blinds you, and you know you can't have it? Because she had not asked me, I did not answer. You start feeling that goodness and beauty are for other people. For men, if you're a woman, whites, if you're non-white, even the simple things, especially the simple things, like being wanted for yourself. To keep from feeling like waste or destroying yourself, you have to destroy them. Deny them here, she touched my chest. And I did that. Does that sound awful? Um, so, you know, in a way, a little bit of an interesting additional commentary from a totally different character, even uh, of some of the things Bannon, the soul catcher, was talking about, you know, where like you you have to uh, have these cravings, but then maybe you just if you get desperate enough, give up completely or, or something. Or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Evelyn Pomeroy is, is maybe a character that in a way like embodies that eventual move toward mediocrity uh because you know we who knows exactly how how much talent she had at a had as a writer but it's pretty clear that you know she had a an like barely noticed debut novel and then that basically crushed her and she never really did much after that she's been like working and tinkering on this other novel apparently for a long 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 time and hasn't put anything else out there to be critiqued so um she seems to have kind of just settled for this teaching life and settled into a, you know, just a, a mid-level role here in Spartanburg. And um, so, yeah, it, it, even, you know, even in th through the voice of a character, Johnson can comment on something like, you know, the difficulty of being an artist and trying to mm -hmm. make that happen. Um, so that stood out to me uh, in that little bit of dialogue. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wonder though, if the idea is uh, like, you know, like it, it, would this be an example of that sort of mediocrity? I guess in some ways uh, it, it would have to be, but um, it, it, on another level, uh, like earlier on uh, before this passage, when, when Evelyn is first introduced, so she, she said to like have written this, th this book that it was well received, but it was, you know, only written about in just like a couple of uh, magazines or whatever, and then just kind of ignored um so yeah then she sort of starts tinkering with this next book uh it's kind of like implied i guess that she's doing it because maybe she's a little bit fearful of actually producing anything so she mm -hmm. instead just kind of like does this you know engages in this kind of like forever project that is meant to never in fact finish um at the same time i i, I wonder if that's you know just simply my uh reading of it since it uh andrew does say uh or rather it's, it's characterized in this way that uh, she does like totally still love literature, right? She never gives mm -hmm. that up. She never becomes like the, this, you know, person that abandons it and starts to like turn her back on it. And, and, and even like say that it's unimportant, right? Cause th that is a very kind of common, you know, refrain among, you know, ex artists, like, you know, why should I, you know, fucking do this anymore? This is all bullshit. Right. Most famously, I guess, with uh, Ar Arthur Rimbo, right. After gets get, getting some fame uh, early on in his uh, teens to very early twenties, he just, you know, becomes this kind of adventurer uh, and dies uh, as a result of, of one of these uh, uh, misadventures. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, she, you, 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 you're never, uh, you're, you're in fact, you know, given the opposite here that, you know, perhaps she actually did at the end uh, fully understand and embrace her nature, right? Uh, this this thing this thing that Bannon uh, says again and again, you know, he says like it's it's very hard, right, for a man to accept his nature, right? It's 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 very hard to just like go with that, right? Because you know the the default position I think for most people is. Uh, there's always like something good out there, something better out there other than what I have, what I am. Um, and, you know, that's just kind of like the core of Buddhism, right? Um, or a, a, one of the cores of Buddhism. And, you know, like Evelyn, perhaps like, you know, she, she, she does come to these understandings and she never rejects beauty. She never says it's insufficient. Uh, maybe she just, uh, maybe she does eventually gladly or acceptingly become part of the audience, right? That That is also... You know, uh, I guess I guess it's mediocrity in one way, but it's also not the mediocrity of someone that will 
plow forward regardless, putting bad work into the world, perhaps even get celebrated for it, right? Which is an ob- objectively bad thing to do. Um, you know, she just comes to sort of uh, uh, accept it, accept her place. Like this, you know, uh, she, she, she might be like one of the first characters in the book actually that uh, uh, does do what, what you know, Oxford and Tail sort of uh, at least, I guess, like suggests, you know, people to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, where we, do you want to uh, go I, next? I, I, I guess we did. We didn't read uh, the the wedding, but I mean, you know, it's it's just this like scene with like you know all these characters doing things that you know both Andrew and, and Peggy they 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 just view the wedding and they're like this is just you know silly, this is ritual, this is nonsense, and you have these like characters that kind of like pop around and they try to like all have these conversations and they're very they're very like you know Woody Allen esque characters in the sense that. Um, they're saying like very like silly, stupid things. Right. Uh, and you could imagine the camera sort of like staying on them as they say something dumb and then, you know, like moving on to the, to, to the next scene. But instead here, you know, because Charles Johnson is more of a kind of like philosophical writer, there was like little like sub sub commentaries on, you know, little asinine things that people say. Um, and you know, like it's, 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 one, it's one of those things where, um, we get, uh, 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 so like, you know, we, 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 we get the marriage, right. And it has this like circus like atmosphere in the white world, right. This is a marriage clearly in the white world from the white world, all the privileges of the white world, all the moods of the white world, um, all the theatrics of the white world. Uh, and, 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 uh, just a few pages later, um, we get to the point where suddenly there's like a, a slave auction, right. And uh, Andrew mm-hmm. decides to go visit the slave auction, and it has the same exact like circus-like atmosphere as the wedding, right? Mm-hmm. And they're not even separated by chapters, right? It's all within the same chapter. So you have a, a, a circus of one type, the circus of samsara, right? I, I think it's kind of fair to say that at this point, Andrew is like he was with, with Flo with Flo Hatfield in a life of samsara. Here again, he's he's in a life of samsara, except you know it's it's much more. I guess it's it's more credible. It's less destructive. It's not just a sensual life. He clearly has an intellectual connection here, um, and, and he's able to have a normal relationship. But mm-hmm. it, I, I just found it very telling how we have you know the, the white world circus, and then we have you know another circus here, right? It's it and you know it, it is a circus that is led by the white world again, right? These are white, you know, uh, auctioneers, but, you know, now, now it's black people th- that are part of the circus, right? It's the same, you know, kind of uh, atmosphere, right? We go from wedding to this and yet, um, you know, for many, you know, for many people that are, you know, part of it, uh, uh, nothing has changed, right? At least if you're uh, the one actually heading the auction. Um, yeah. So, yeah, then, I mean, within, within this scene, in the slave auction he's there and and attending and um i forget i mean does he hold out some hope that i think he holds out hope that maybe somebody from cripple gate will be there reb he's just hoping he's hoping that reb is there he wants reb to show okay because because remember because at at this point he actually has received so Reb has this ring, right? He's from this like fictional tribe, the Almusri, which makes later an appearance uh, much more prominently in um, uh, Middle Passage, uh, that that other novel from from uh, Johnson. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, so Reb is like from this same like Almusri, this fictional tribe, and he has like a, a ring that is supposed to be prototypical of this tribe, um, and uh, he, you know, he, he's sort of he's given it as a wedding gift. Uh, by the soul catcher, right? Um, uh, to to Andrew, right? He opens it up and yeah. he he takes it to mean that perhaps um, uh, uh, Reb uh, has died, right? right? Or or perhaps it means something else. Uh, so he he's he's going to um, you know check out this this auction in the hopes that perhaps Reb is there now. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. So he's there and um, he's he's like obviously pretty disgusted by the whole scene and, and the process and everything else. And like, he does make a comment, like he, t- the town is really um, eerily quiet, like leading up mm-hmm. to this. Right. And I, he's got like, he's like wondering why and what's going on. And then he 
kind of realizes that maybe there's this sketchy back room uh, auction going on. So anyway, um, you know, he ends up seeing Minty there and this, this first woman that he had loved and really kind of been like setting out on the, the, the escapades that he has uh, from Cripplegate originally to try to get his freedom and eventually come back for her. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she was a driving force initially for him and, and kind of in always has been a little bit in the background. And now, um, you know, she's in really bad shape and has been passed around to multiple different slave owners and mm -hmm. uh, like very obviously abused uh, physically and sexually. Uh, it sounds like she was in the care of a colonel who was particularly, um, you know, demented and bad to her. Mm -hmm. but Andrew's like immediately, um, you know, just trying to figure out a way that he could, could take her, you know, could pay for her and end her misery. Um, and so he, how does this go? He decides to kind of just make a, a deal for it. He offers $20 and the auctioneer, uh, this is after no one had taken her obviously at the auction. So then the auctioneer says, well, you need 200 and uh, Andrew's obviously miffed at that since no one would have paid anything uh, just a little bit ago. But now he's like, well, listen, you know, this is what I've been told I'm taking for her or else nothing. And so uh, he decides to, you know, to put basically this earnest money down. And then within a month, he's got to come up with the rest of the money. So he kind of, once again, in a quick thinking style, kind of like hatches this plan where he thinks to himself, maybe under, you know, my father-in-law, uh, could spot me this money. And of course, you know, we can already anticipate ways in which that could backfire, but uh, he's mm -hmm. just, he's just going for it here. And so he does, you know, he ends up being able to, to walk away with Minty um, and she's in a really bad state and, and for quite a while doesn't realize who he is. And eventually he unveils himself to her. And um, he of course is concerned about what Peggy's reaction is going to be once he gets Minty home um, and, and honestly, like it's, uh, it speaks well to, to Peggy's character. You know, there's kind of this sweet moment where he gets home and it's, it's a little bit again, like reminiscent of something earlier in the book, chiming back at us here where, um, you know, his, his father had been afraid to go back to his wife after like the carousing and drinking. And it led to like this whole hilarious scene that spawned mm -hmm. Andrew. Well, now he's like, okay, I've done something here. Um, I've purchased a slave and I've got to like go back to my wife and try to explain what's gone on and make her understand. And like, there's so many ways in which I could end up outed here, you know, like outing myself. Um, and, and that pretty much does happen. You know, he, he tells her that this is a former lover of his and um, she just, you know, is hesitant at first, but, but ends up accepting the whole situation and I would say for me reading it, that was a bit unexpected and kind of a nice turn of character uh, from Peggy and gives you like, I guess more hope. Like that was one of the moments where like more hope for Andrew's future clicked in for me. Cause I was like, wow, okay, maybe he actually, despite the facade that he's put up this whole time to eventually end up marrying Peggy, like he seems to have married a good person here and mm -hmm you know, they they could have a chance at a, at a good life together. And so uh, what really happens from there? I mean, I guess that she's in such bad shape that she needs immediate medical attention, but um, Dr. Undercliff is away seeing to other patients. And so there's some time that passes where Minty, like she's, she's really trying to be strong of character uh, and strong of body, even though she's definitely not, but she kind of puts their house in order for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and like teaches Peggy some other skills. And again, there's kind of some sweet scenes, you know, that go on, uh, there mm -hmm. at their, their cabin. And, uh, but then eventually, you know, by the time the undercliff gets back, Minty's more, she's more or less on her deathbed. And so, uh, then in the context of all of that, the soul catcher shows up again, which leads to the final scenes of the book. So, uh, do you want to take it from there? Yeah, so the the soul catcher, um, 
Uh, so in, in, in the final chapter where the soul catcher uh, basically asks him to, you know, come out, right? Um, yeah. Which the final chapter is called The Call, right? Which is what? No, that that's the one or, right right before uh, the last chapter. Okay. This is, Oh, it's when he shows up and says, Andrew, we got business right at the end of the chapter. Yeah. Moksha, Moksha is the final chapter. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so he, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, soul catcher, um, catches up to Andrew. Of course, he's, he's always like known who he is, what he's doing. Right. Um, he, he's never like too far away. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the, the paragraph begins. So like, first of all, the, the text like starts to be like a little bit different than what, um, I guess the rest of the style is in the sense that he's, he's making slightly different stylistic choices. This is page 169. Um, fluid, a crazy quilt of others features, the soul catcher's face, his fingers on my shoulder beat with the pulse throb of countless bondsmen in his bloodstream, women and children murdered with pistols, knives tramped by his war horse, strangled, whipped, suffocated, lynched, beheaded, burned to death, starved, stoned, bombed, thrown from heights, pushed into machinery, drowned, clubbed, impaled, killed by flame, tortured, without any kind of um, uh, commas there. Uh, yeah, no punctuation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, at the beginning, you kind of start, you start with a few commas, right? Like fluid, a crazy quote of others' mm -hmm. features. Uh, but even at the, at the beginning, like you have this nice, uh, like, like set of techniques where you have a bunch of words that are just kind of compound words. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of, you know, parallels nicely this idea that the soul catcher is a composite of like his face is a composite of others. Uh, his, mm -hmm. his tattoos show composites of others' lives, other people's lives, you know, insects lives, you know, uh, things that he's, uh, uh killed people that he's killed, um, you have, for example, crazy quilt, you know, uh, one word as a compound. Soul catcher, of course, uh, uh, compound, uh, no spaces. Uh, pulse throb, right? This is not a, a, a normal word. This is just hit, you know, Johnson's own compound. Uh, bondsman, bloodstream, right? Compound, compound, right? Just getting at this mm -hmm. idea, right, of, of this composite. So Bannon seems to be taking him out uh possibly to kill him and you just sort of wonder well why why wouldn't he kill him right i mean it seems like he killed his father uh based on uh this ring uh either he brought brought a uh, reb back to some sort of slave auction or perhaps he also killed him you know uh, there there's nothing that that andrew has done thus far uh that uh would you know prevent the same kind of fate right so it seems um so he tells him you know i have a surprise for you and uh, ultimately after a conversation uh he asks you know where is reb and uh uh the soul catcher says that uh he he just you know he couldn't actually get reb right he couldn't catch him um and the way he characterizes it on page 174 in the middle um uh, yo friend, as I was saying, didn't have no place inside him for me to settle. He wasn't positioned nowhere. Scratching his head, the soul catcher chuckled. Before, afterwards, and in between, didn't mean nothing to him. He had no home, no permanent home. He didn't care about merit or evil. What I'm saying, his fist struck the tree behind us, is that I couldn't entirely become the nigga because you got to have something dead or static already inside you, an image of yourself for a real safe character to latch onto. Um, so he, then he asks about, about, the, uh, about the ring and the soul catcher says, Reb sold that in Kentucky, said Bannon, to get ahead of anything that identify him. Hawkins, you owe me $30 and me and Mammy gonna need every penny. We're getting married since I'm out of work. I always said that I'd quit if I come across a Negro I couldn't catch. He threw his derringer into the weeds. Only reason I couldn't marry Mammy before, get her out of the cat house, is because I stayed on the road so much, right? So you also get this like final little like, you know, little bit of characterization, right? First, on the one hand that the soul catcher all, you know, does have this set of principles that he follows. They could be twisted, they could be warped, they could be evil, whatever, but he, he has a set of rules and he's following them. 
Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the, the, the second part is, well, he also wants to get married and he couldn't do this like kind of prosaic thing simply because, you know, his work, you know, kept him, uh, uh, you know, outside of the house too long. Right. A very kind of euphemistic way of putting it, but you know, there you go. He has like somebody that he loves. There is like somebody also that, that, uh, loves him. Um, and, you know, I guess this is there to like, uh, make him a little bit more relatable. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Part of me wondered though, so like uh, you had some issues with like, you know, some of the ending in the endings in the book, uh, um, you know, th this part, you know, it definitely, it, it makes sense, right? Uh, I mean, uh, it, it does fit exactly what he's doing, uh, the, the system that he's laid out. We saw earlier on that Rab definitely had this kind of Buddhist-like uh, quality to him. Right, these like uh, ideal uh, sets of behaviors that you know the the book uh, he keeps uh, going after. So it's not like this comes out of nowhere, but uh, it, it does feel a little bit like a Deus Ex Machina, right? Uh, it, but you know, maybe a little bit inverted in the sense that Reb didn't come out come out out of anywhere, right? He's not, you know, the god out of the machine. We know exactly this was his nature. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, simply because like he, he's sort of, he's sort of saved, right? Like he, like Andrew gets saved from, uh, getting murdered, not based on anything that he himself really does. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps I guess. So the soul catcher started like stalking Reb because he knew that Reb was the one that was like physically going, uh, you know, some distance away. Whereas, you know, uh, Andrew was sort of like just stay staying behind. Um, so he went after Reb first and by virtue of going after him first, he realized that he couldn't actually catch him. So therefore he has, he has to retire. Uh, but you know, Andrew doesn't in fact do anything himself that would make him more deserving of life right in this kind of mm -hmm. very you know basic sense than for example you know uh um uh than than, than maddie right than 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 george right then then pretty much you know anyone that we've come across and certainly not you know more than than um uh 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 uh, uh you know like like pr pretty much anybody right like there's there there's just a sense that he, he, here's this guy that that you know he's able to pass for white based on an accident, right? He, he's, he's born into this um, uh, 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 family, right? And he's able to have a more privileged kind of slave-like existence. And, th you know, this does like feed into the, the greater kind of portions of the novel. I mean, like so much of this, and we say this, it says this all the time, right? That, you know, uh, if, if, if things were just slightly different, right? Uh, his life would have turned out completely differently as well. Right, mm -hmm. we we get this uh, sense all the time. It's emphasized. It's it's baked into the philosophy, um, but you know the fact that he also escapes death in this way, it does feel just a little bit forced. Right, it's it's not enough for me to say that it's a real serious flaw. Probably because again, given that you have all these like feedback loops uh, within the philosophy, but it did it did sort of like come out a little bit you know um uh, unexpectedly from a purely kind of plot perspective not not from a, a philosophical perspective um but of course like I, I think like everything is more or less justified uh by the time that we get to like that last big paragraph right um where uh, 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 Andrew is asking about the whereabouts of, of all these people and all these things. And he's asking other philosophical questions, right? He clearly has, you know, other questions that he's not uh, ready to quite ask. And, you know, the soul catcher uh, tries to answer them by, you know, um, undoing his shirt and, and, and showing Andrew uh, exactly what um, uh, it says. Uh, I mean, do you want to take that paragraph? Yeah, uh, the one on one seventy five. Yeah, when when he says he's here, ask him yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, right before that, Andrew says, "Did he speak of me?" I ask Bannon. What I must know is if he died feeling I despised him, or if he I lowered my voice a little died hating me. And then the soul catcher did a strange thing. His shirt had been opened to his navel. It puffed out a poorly tied umbilicus. I thought but hid his chest as we talked. Bannon undid the last three buttons, pulling off his shirt entirely and bid me move closer. He's here, the soul catcher said. Ask him yourself. This pulled me up short. 
I waited for the soul catcher's explanation, my gaze dropping from his face to his chest and forearms, for the intricately woven brown tattoos presented in the brilliance of the silver gray sky at dawn, an impossible flesh tapestry of a thousand individualities, no longer static, mere drawings, but if you looked at them long enough, bodies moving like Lilliputians over the surface of his skin. Not tattoos at all, I saw, but forms sardined in his contour, creatures Bannon had killed since childhood. Spineless insects, flies he'd be winged, yet even the tiniest of these thrashing within the body mosaic was, clearly, a society as complex as the higher forms, a concrescence of molecules, cells, atoms, in concert, for nothing in the necropolis he'd filled stood alone, wished to stand alone, had to stand alone. And the commonwealth of the dead shape-shifted on his chest, his full belly, his fat shoulders, traded hand for claw, feet for hooves, legs for wings, their metamorphosis having no purpose beyond the delight the universe took in diversity for its own sake, the proliferation of beauty, and yet all were conserved in this process of doubling. Nothing was lost in the masquerade, the costume, the cosmic costume ball, where behind every different mask at the party, behind snout, beak, nose, and blossom, the self-same face was uncovered at midnight, and this was my father, appearing briefly in the dead boy moon as he gave Flo Hatfield a goodly stroke, and, at the instant of convulsive orgasm, opened his mouth as wide as that of the dying steer Bannon slew in his teens. Was that steer, then several others, and I lost his figure in this field of energy, where the profound mystery of the one and the many gave me back my father again and again his love in every being from grub worms to giant sumacs. For these two were my father and in the final face I saw in the soul catcher, which shook tears from me, my own face, for he had duplicated portions of me during the early days of the hunt. I was my father's father and he my child. And that's all one sentence. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's much better than, you know, the, uh, Ulysses, uh, James Joyce run on sentences. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I think this is probably the, maybe if, if I were to ask, like, what is the one best individual passage, right. In, in, in the novel, I would, I would say it's, it's this, mm-hmm. right. Um, all, all these things that we're sort of adjudicating. Right. Um, and even like this also like tempers, like some of my, like, you know, very kind of like gentle criticism before that this seems like a little bit, contrived um you know uh we could sort of like talk about like who's deserving of what like did george deserve to die versus you know uh andrew didn't why or why not uh how did this happen why didn't it happen and a lot of this you know the answer is it's kind of like a lot of it is happenstance and sort some of the answers here right i was my father's father and he my child george clearly has flaws andrew has flaws um and you know it, it, it in some senses they do kind of you know, they, 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 they do uh, kind of come together, right? Um, it's, it's, it becomes hard to, you know, um, uh, appropriate one from the other, right? Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, and, well, and, and, yeah. Well, yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I mean, um, so it, I, I should say that's not all one sentence, but the, that final paragraph is only three sentences, you know, from not tattoos at all, I saw. And then all the way through the end, that that was one yeah. sentence. So, yeah, all, um, almost all of it, yeah, is is one sentence except for that very beginning. Right. Um, it's it's it's, it's, so, all, it's and like from like a writerly perspective, it's almost as if like the beginning first few sentences, which are kind of short, they're kind of like you know the spring loading, right? You sort of mm-hmm. need that. You sort yeah. of need that at the beginning to have this. You know, I wouldn't call it a sprint, but it's this kind of like you know, a uh, uh, slow, you know, a uh, movement, right. You, you, you need to sort of corral some energy for that right early on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, we talked about Johnson's poeticism, right. And in, in the, the way that he writes and it's abundant throughout the whole book, but uh, like you said, you know, if, if you had to rank just passages of, you know, a, a page or so, um, it's right up there at the top and maybe the top and it's um it, it's again like so uh filmic in a way you know like it's it's just the summary of so many things you know uh, th- these different themes throughout the book uh, probably i would guess the fact that johnson elected to make it all one sentence is also 
down to again that the Buddhist philosophy and and context of some of this and foregoing you know uh, division between these lines and, and kind of like hinting that all uh, all is one, one is all, and, and these things feed into each other. Um, you know, you could even say that like that that final passage there. I mean, in, in a way, it it just reads like a poem. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, if you were to take that and give it line breaks and everything, I mean, that could be a pretty wonderful poem, uh, potentially. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and then, uh, like you were saying, you know, I, so my comment in our notes uh, before the show about, you know, kind of questioning the end of the book. Um, so there, there's a paragraph after this and then one single line paragraph uh, after correct. that and it, it ends then correct yeah so there's one more paragraph which is just sort of a summary of some things that happened from then on you know the soul catcher unbuttoned or buttoned his shirt covering the theater of tattoos he helped me a free man back to his wagon and delivered me dazed to my wife's doorstep um and then it, it talks about several of these characters and then the final line is this is my tale um so a couple things, you know, uh, first of all, I think it's interesting, you know, he helped me a free man back to his wagon. It's like, well, I mean, that's true in the sense that now Bannon has decided to stop pursuing him. So, mm. uh, you know, so, so he's, he's kind of free of that formerly ever present, uh, tyranny in his life, but it's also still conditional. You know, he has to pass for white this entire mm. time for the rest of his life, you know, I mean, if, if you think about the challenge or even try to think about the challenge that that would present to somebody, uh, you know, even as like charismatic and intelligent and quick witted as someone like Andrew is, it's still, uh, you know, kind of, kind of wild to even conceptualize what he's going to be required to do from here forward in order to remain free. Um, I guess. Is, is, is that really, is that really true? I mean, maybe well, I mean, this, uh, 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 the, like only a few years later, right? We have, uh, just the end of the civil war, right? Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, I suppose. So, yeah. So, so, but, so he, so he gets, he gets a daughter 1861, it says, um, yeah, yeah. But, so, uh, uh, but, but I mean, maybe for other reasons, right. He probably would, you know, it, it, it's hard to say, right. Like, is it, you know, you can't really, you can't fault someone for trying to pass, as white, you know, like during like fucking like reconstruction, right. Even, you know, after oh, the yeah. war, right. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's bound to happen. Right. So, and that's bound to have, you know, uh, knock on effects on your psyche. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's, in some ways he, he, uh, I doubt, uh, he would truly get to that stage in his life. Right. Uh, it's, it's not clear, you know, for, for by the ending that he gets to that stage in his life where he's able to like discard, um, these cravings, these cravings, and he's able to, you know, be like fully, you know, integrated and healthy, right. In, in the way that the, in, in the way that perhaps Reb, you know, might be in some ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, um, anyway, my, my only real criticism, I suppose, of, of this ending was that scene with the soul catcher, and the language there is is so excellent and so powerful that it, it felt to me like uh, maybe some sort of proper ending for the novel, and and we could have you know not really had any of this final tying up of a couple different bows to tell us what happened to anybody, um, and just let the reader's imagination kind of run with it from that final scene under the tree with the soul catcher. Um, so it's it's not a bad ending to put that paragraph in there, I just felt like it maybe weakened it slightly. Uh, what did you think? Do you disagree with that or? Um, I mean, uh, I, I would probably have to think about it a little bit more, but, uh, it, it doesn't seem like, uh, it doesn't seem like it hinders too much. I mean, b- besides the fact that it, it you know, it, it ties some of those, uh, loose ends like we have, for example, um, so like uh, on April 23rd, 1861, wife bore a girl, six pounds, six ounces, delivered by du- Dr. Undercliff, who took leave on this of this life on the eve of Grant's capture of Fort Henry, right? So very quickly, we have like, you know, a- everything is just kind of condensed, right? We have the mm-hmm. child, we have the death of the, of the, um, of the father-in-law, and then we have uh, stated in this way, the end of the Civil War, 
right? The next sentence, the awakening of Eve Yoramop, 1863, which is uh, seems to be the book written by uh, that earlier uh, character, right? That she was just trying to forever write, 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 write. You know, is it ever going to actually come? It seems like it does actually come out, uh, but it was overshadowed by the American edition of Trollope's Framley uh a parsonage and was only reviewed with five other books in the book bin column of the press. According to rumor, Flo Hatfield did not marry again, but took the vet as her final lover. And in Illinois in 1865, Reb built his finest coffin, the one in which they laid Abraham Lincoln to rest after the war. And that that's almost like, you know, to me, I'm just taking it as a little bit of like pushback against some of the PC narratives that, you know, could have been emerging at the time that, you know, Abraham Lincoln was worthless, right? You know, he, mm-hmm. you know, let's let's you know, let's let's criticize him because he 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 didn't think like the white people of like you know 2021. Um, you know, he, Reb Reserve is like his his greatest coffin for Abraham Lincoln, right? Uh, after the war, Fruity and I turned to the business of rebuilding with our daughter Anna, then parentheses, all is conserved semicolon all and parentheses the world um i've always uh, thought that that you know line was was great right um mm-hmm. the p- parenthetical all is conserved all right because th- that you know like yes he's tying up some of the you know character arcs which aren't even necessarily that important although they are like a nice touch uh but in the end you do have that you know philosophical tie-in that i i think is more important even uh, and then you know the ending, like this is my tale, which is uh, I mean, it's not necess- it's not necessarily like one of these like great lines or whatever, but you know, it's a perfectly valid, you know, uh, functional ending. So I, I I'm more inclined to agree with you on so like there's these two small chapters in between that are it's not from Andrew's perspective, it's just uh uh the uh uh authorial voice. This could be Charles Johnson, this could be you know something else, someone else from the present, but um, these two chapters that basically go into like uh, 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 like the, the history of slave narratives, and then mm-hmm. a second chapter that um, uh, it's how like the manumission of the first person uh, narrator, which kind of like explains how Andrew is able to glimpse like so much into um, you know all, all these happenings that he couldn't possibly be privy to. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, that this is like, you know, w- is this his imagination? Is it something else? And it tries to sort of establish that philosophically. But, you know, um, you know, as I was reading uh, uh, the book, like rereading it again, like more recently this time, you know, immediately, you know, uh, from the first page, I was like, right. So Andrew clearly knows certain things here that he's not supposed to know. As the book goes on, there's more examples of this. And there's and not just that, but there's also something that Charles Johnson doesn't t- touch on in, in those two chapters is um, uh, the fact that we have a large number of like uh, anachronisms, right? So uh, things that, you know, sh- shouldn't really belong. Like we have phrases like chop suey, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, chop suey wasn't really in, 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 in the language then. Um, we have uh, uh, like... I don't want to say like ways of being, but you also, you do have like characteristics and you have like little speech patterns and just like items that are clearly, you know, taken from like the 20th century, right. Um, uh, As opposed to the 19th. And, uh, but, you know, to me, like, you know, going back to like this idea of um, uh, the, 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 the Buddhist cycles within the fact that we have this like essentially penultimate paragraph, which is, you know, all is kind of like put into this, you know, conflated form, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's not beyond reason that, you know, here in the slave narrative, you would have like little, just little drips from the future, right? They're not distracting. They're not crazy. They're not over the top. Even something like chop suey, you know, did exist in the 1800s, although very unlikely that, you know, a, a black man from the South would have known about it. Um, but it's, it's like this, like little, little drip of items from the future that, you know, I, I, I think it does work philosophically. Uh, 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 with the text, it works artistically with the text. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that those two chapters were were necessary in that regard, right? It's, it's, it's almost this kind of like, 
you know, um, and, and the fact that the, the the voice is much closer to Charles Johnson himself than anything else in the text, right? This is much more so like the, a modern day person speaking. So if, if yeah. anyone is Charles Johnson within the text, it would probably be those two chapters. Um, the fact that it feels like a kind of, you know, he's kind of like stepping in to, you know, disarm any potential criticism when in some ways, like being a king, right, you shouldn't be the one swatting flies, right? Uh, and, you know, it feels like a little bit like like unnecessary fly swatting, right? Uh, if people would, would, you know, really, really, you know, take it to heart, they're like, my goodness, like, there's no way that a phrase like chop suey belongs in a text like this. You know, th th that is also an, kind of like unfair criticism that should probably be, you know, left to its own devices. But again, like these are, you know, these are very sort of like gentle um, uh, items, right? There's not really much that you could say about this book uh, in, in in the form of, uh, you know, any kind of like real criticism, right? I mean, it's a it's a, it's a great novel. Uh, it's one of the greatest uh -huh. novels uh, written, period. Um, and you know, to say too much beyond that, you know, would would uh, in you know the um, in the Buddha sense, you know, take us away from from the point, right? It, it would take us away from the mission. Yeah. Yeah, that's just it. You know, um, I, I would echo your comments on those two intermission kind of chapters. And my, I guess my only thought was, um, you know, I kept trying to think, why would Johnson elect to include these as chapters that interrupt the novel, rather than just uh, put these in the introduction or something, you know, and kind of explain like, hey, you're, you're going to you're going to see a couple things as we go along here um, that that aren't, you know, the the dead standard for a novel of this type and what you're going to expect. And here's just, uh, you know, maybe some thoughts. Um, and I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe he thought that that it would pack more of a punch by just kind of appearing out of nowhere, um, you know, in the, the actual body of the novel. But uh yeah, I mean, I think that by, especially by the time that they do appear, um, you, you've been along for this ride long enough and you, at least for me, you know, you've kind of accepted what is happening in terms of some of the, the devices used. And if you need to, you know, you, you suspend some disbelief and I just think the novel is so good and it's so enjoyable that I, you know, it never was I thinking to myself, you know, well, the novel's great, except that I'm really bothered by the way that, you know, he's altering the traditional slave narrative. Or I'm really bothered by the way that Andrew knows all these things that he mm -hmm. shouldn't know. I mean, it just never occurred to me once. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, unless we were to hear, you know, from Charles Johnson himself on the, that specific decision. Mm -hmm. uh, it just seemed to me like, you know, I don't know that it really added anything to the novel. And so maybe then it could have just not been included, but um, yeah, as you just said, I mean, it, that, and then my, I guess maybe my personal preference for a little bit more of an oblique ending rather than the the summary paragraph ending are like mm. pretty much the, the most I can say uh, in, in the form of criticism. It's just really, really mm. a great work of art. Mm. So um, fun to read it again and fun to discuss it. Yeah. And just a quick thing, uh, uh, like comparing to, to the uh, ending in um, uh, Middle Passage. So I, mm -hmm. I read uh, Middle Passage uh, uh, once and then once uh, once more uh, for a class that I took actually in college. And I remember the professor uh, by the end of like when we got to the end of the novel, she was like, and we have this like fairy tale ending. Right, where they live happily ever after. When very clearly, it was very clearly not the case. Right, uh, in in um, in in uh, Middle Passage, ultimately, I forget the the protagonist's name, but he's not able to have sex with you know his new wife, who became like you know yes, it's fairy tale in the sense that he's able to make it back home alive, and this woman that was like fat that he was trying to escape is now like you know thin and beautiful. Um, so it's fairy tale in that sense, but. He's so clearly, you know, uh, uh, traumatized by his experiences uh, on the slave ship that he's not able to have sex and he's not able to have a normal life from that point forward. Here, um, it's it's a little bit different in the sense that uh, they seem to be able to come to like a have like a normal family and 
Um, everything is just sort of kind of like, like you said, has like a little bow on top, but, um, you, you still have this like sense at the end that, okay, if, 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 if his father died, was killed in this way. Um, and Andrew is like, you know, the, the only kind of casualty, uh, that is not in fact a casualty, right? Maybe psychologically a casualty. Uh, what exactly, again, what did he do to, to actually deserve that? If it's, if it's mere accident, like if we do, you know, buy in the idea that this is just, you know, constantly, you know, especially passing for what you're on this kind of precipice, you could lean one way or the other, right? You could either go to destruction or you could live, right? And this is just in the nature of being, you know, black in the 1800s is in the nature, you know, of being black uh, today, even in many places in America. Um, yeah. If we if we take that to be reality, uh, you still get the sense, you know, at the end of the book that um, uh, psychologically, like there, there, there is no clean ending for Andrew, right? In the same way that, you know, perhaps in a more, you know, overt fashion, we could say the same thing in Middle Passage, there is no clean you know, uh, ending, uh, for those characters either. Um, so sure. anyway, that, that's, that would be my, my, I guess, final comment on that. Yeah. Well, I agree. I mean, even though Andrew becomes a free man in this novel, uh, it's, it's certainly not all rosy. It's not a fairy tale ending. You know, Minty's death is pretty gruesome. And I think that it, there's, there's this hope as a reader, that when he buys her and, and can hopefully give her a better life, that that's going to happen and she'll be able to recover and, and, uh, and live on. And you, you also wonder maybe for a second, if he's going to find a way to leave Peggy and try to still be with Minty since she was his first love, you just don't know, but, but then she dies uh, mm -hmm. pretty quickly. And uh, this is one of the other final things I'll say that I, I've mentioned briefly maybe earlier but to to you in the show notes i said uh in addition to the you know like the, the overall comedy and tragedy that's all blended together here um there's there's still this levity to the book you know i mean so many people that andrew cares about or loves uh die along mm -hmm. the course of of this book so there's a lot of tragedy um and yet it still, it still moves along. And maybe part of it is that he's, uh, he's pretty resilient. Maybe he's also just somewhat unfortunately accustomed to death and the exp expectation of death from living a slave's life. Mm -hmm. But uh, nonetheless, there's just not ever any melodrama from Johnson in the mm -hmm. way that these characters depart. Uh, some certainly, Minty's death maybe comes the closest to that, but but it's still not that way, and uh, it's it's just another way in which he really handled a lot of different things well in this novel. But um, anyway, yeah, it's it, it's not a fairy tale ending, but it's still uh, still a, a pretty <laughs> pretty good ending mm -hmm. for Andrew, all things considered. He mm -hmm. he did make it through and. Um, completed his ox herding tale i suppose all right so we should uh end it here um i know that i've been behind uh some of these videos we didn't do an artifact last month but hopefully i'll have another artifact actually a week from now new website new essays lots of stuff uh hopefully uh a couple of uh not your liberal streams uh for the month of may as well so lots of stuff coming uh thank you guys for uh watching if you haven't subscribed please do so if you haven't hit like please do so and we'll see you guys soon